Ah, yes. Let me begin by saying a very good Sunday morning to you, my dear friends, and welcome to uh, today's edition of uh, Sundays. Yeah, Sundays with George Grant. Kind of get confused. Seems like every day, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the only day I'm not on the air at 9 o'clock in the morning is on uh, Saturday. So far, we're going to keep it that way, friends. Yes, a very good morning to you, and thank you very much for joining us for SWGG. Today happens to be the 19th day of uh, the month, 19th day of January, as we scurry through the first month of 2020. I see that... Uh, ooh, 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 ooh. Anthea wins the race this morning. Well, hello there, Anthea. She's first. Congratulations, young lady. And uh, Mr. T.F. Richards is second. Let's see where T.F. is this morning, T.F. T.F. says uh, from a snow-ridden Idaho. You know, by the end of the week, you've probably traversed the entire United States. God knows, if they built a road between Florida and Grenada, he'd probably be down here as well. Hey, TF, good to see you. Um, I see that uh, I see that people in, the, where is it, uh, New York are having uh, quite a bit of snow. So uh, I hope that uh, you're safe and sound where you are. Who else is there? Who else is there? Anthony DeRiggs is saying good morning. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Bernard Gilbert saying hi to you guys as well. Uh, TF says uh, the volume is very low. Well, I certainly hope it's a little bit better now. Um, just cranked it up a little bit. And uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Arthur Langan is saying good morning from a cold Brooklyn. Yeah, TF. So you're in Idaho. Arthur is in Brooklyn where it's cold, and uh, Arthur, I saw the videos you were posting last night with the snow coming down. I hope you haven't had too much of an accumulation. Yeah, then again, it's winter, so I hope you have had a lot of snow, and that you're going to make the most of it, because today is only the 19th of uh, January, so you got a way to go. Peter Bishop is saying good morning from a cold Long Island. Hello there, Pedro. Cold, 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 cold. And uh, hello. I haven't seen this man show up this early for a program. Wonder what's going on. Hey. When we take a look at the uh, rundown this morning, we'll probably understand why Mr. Randall Robinson is in there so early this morning. And not only that, he's sending every blessing on your Sunday. Well, thank you very much, TF. And Grenada Sunshine is also there with us, just popping in. Well, kind of slow to pop in there this morning, girl, but nice to see you as always. Now, my dear friends, now, let us get to the rundown. As always, Sunday morning, you ain't going nowhere without the buzz. In the buzz this morning, you do have a reading from the Holy Scriptures. I also <laughs> regret to inform you that little angel is taking the day off. She's not going to be with us today. Um, I certainly hope you have a wonderful weekend, little angel. We're going to miss you. And uh, so... Let's get into the editorials. <laughs> did he say editorials? Yeah, I think that's what he did. Well, I'll tell you, you only have one editorial this morning, pilgrims, and that comes to you from the new today. Always there for you. And they are captioned, Inadequate Resources. Now, that has uh, a lot to do with, has everything to do with the state of firefighting in this country. And this morning, you're going to get an earful and an eyeful 
firefighting. Um, Mr. Worm, the editor of the New Today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, that's what he is, managing editor. Yeah. He attended a press conference which was held at police headquarters up on Fort George with the uh, uh, RGPF. And uh, you're going to hear him firing off some questions to the head honchos at the RGPF this morning. So we'll tell you about that. Actually, let's tell you about that right now. As we get into our features, our features. Ha! Huh. When you take a look at uh, your screen right now, you see it says a rocky start to uh, a rocky start for Grenada in 2020. Oh, what the heck's he talking about? The commissioner, acting commissioner of police, Edwin Martin, held a press conference uh, one day this week. And uh, I think it was cause for concern. You know, he lamented the fact that we've had three major fires. Actually, I think there were four fires uh, within the space of a week here. I think there was one in Paradise. There was one in Molinaire. Everybody knows about the big one on Grenville Street. And then the one on uh, Williamson Road. Four fires. Four in the space of a week. So, yeah, he was concerned about that. He was always very concerned about the shooting of a 16-year-old youngster, young lady, who uh, was shot and killed. Yeah, thank goodness the perpetrator is uh, in custody, and uh, we're going to be following up on that. And uh, road accidents, road accidents, road accidents. Boy, I don't know. I just hope that, you know, you can't just blame it on the authorities. You have to blame it on the idiots who get out there and drive like they own the, own the road. Huh? You keep asking people, don't drink and drive, don't use narcotics and drive, don't speed, obey the regulations. What the heck more could you do besides jail their bunnies. Huh? Yeah. That's probably a solution. If they survive. The sad thing is when they, when they die, quite often they take other people with them. That's the very unfortunate thing about this thing. I don't know. I don't know. Um, could it have something to do with the way we train our drivers? Is our training adequate? Yeah, one of these days we'll take on all of that. So yeah, you're going to hear in that press conference this morning the commissioner addressing a number of issues, and you're going to hear some of the <laughs> some of the questions that were asked by the media. Okay, enough said. The next thing we're going to talk about is another press conference. So you got one video on the RGPF, and you got another one on the CBI, Citizenship by Investment. Yeah. Oh, boy. This past week's post-cabinet briefing dealt with uh, the CBI program. And there were three persons in the hot seat. First of all, uh, Trade Minister Oliver Joseph was there. He was joined by uh, the chairman of the Citizenship by Investment Program, Mr. Excuse me, Senator Chris Dialli. And the, they were joined by the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of the CBI program, as it is now, okay? And supposedly, as you'll hear at the end of the press conference, this, this session was intended to, you know, uh, inform or educate people about the CBI, and also, in particular, clear up any misconceptions, not my words, you'll hear it at the end of the press conference, any misconceptions about the citizenship 
by investment program. Okay. After you have heard the two pieces, we're going to run that by you. No, no. That one is uh, one piece, the RGPF in two parts. At the end of the uh, CBI piece, you decide whether the misconceptions about the CBI program have been cleared up for you. Okie dokie, dokie, dokie. Now, that's our second feature. Our third feature, boy, am I looking forward to this one as well. It's a chronology of the Andal and Associates saga. You know, believe it or not, a lot of people in this country only uh, realized about the difficulties Andal and Associates was having when uh, we heard, Oop, supermarkets closed. Yeah, it's a few weeks just before Christmas. But for those of you who have been following this since, you should be well aware by now that there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Yeah? So I thought, you know, rather than everybody out there just speculating, you know, everybody has an idea of what is or what isn't. I thought, let me speak to Peter Andel. He is the uh, chief executive officer of Andel and Associates. And um, I asked him if he would come in to talk with me last weekend, actually. And then he said he wouldn't mind, but um, he would rather hold off until everything was sorted out. Apparently, although they have reopened the doors, Vandal and Associates, um, they still had some loose ends that needed to be tied up. And uh, I think it's a rational decision on his part. He said, look, just let me wait until everything's tied up. So, this week, I phoned him and uh, said to him, well, Mr. Randall, uh, how about coming in on Sunday morning? And he agreed. What are we going to talk about? I said, sir, I want a chronology. I want you to explain from start to finish what this whole saga has been about. I said, sure. So Mr. Randall was due in here at about 11 o'clock this morning. All right? We're looking forward to having him sit here bit by bit by bit. Okay. Now, that's your rundown. Is that enough or you want more? Nah, we don't have room for more. Actually, on, uh, when I posted the rundown for this morning's program on the uh, SWGG WhatsApp forum, somebody came back and said, oh, you're going to need more time, George. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see, because there's a lot of stuff there to be handled. Now, let me get back. Oh, first of all, yeah, let me get back here now to social media for just a wee bit. Ryan Jabon is saying, good morning. Uh, we've said hi to Arthur already and Peter and Randall and Grenada Sunshine. Margaret Francis, hey girl, you slow this morning or what? Margaret Francis saying, good Sunday morning. Oh, Ryan says, <laughs> here comes Ryan's weather report. 65 Fahrenheit and sunny with a high of 71 in Orlando. Yeah, you should get paid by the National Weather Service, uh, Ryan. Sean Notap, hello there, Sean. Sean is out there in the Azores. Bob Marish Show is saying good morning, class. Claude Padna is saying good morning to you, Mr. Grant, and blessed Sunday to you in the class. Well, we appreciate that, Claude. Dennis Perkins, hello, where's Dennis today? Dennis says, good morning, George. 
Good morning, class. Bright blue skies, sunny and frosty. <laughs> sunny and frosty here in London. Christine and Dennis. So I guess it's Christine typing this morning. It's not Dennis and Christine. Um, Dennis, we have bright blue skies here as well, but it's not frosty. It's anything but. Actually, um, I'm just hoping I don't start sweating in here this morning. The air conditioning is working. You probably hear it in the background, but it's, uh, it's a little bit warm. It's a little bit warm in here this morning. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Brian says, Grenada should be rich and wealthy with CBI funds. <laughs> if only we knew what was happening with those funds. Maybe. Maybe we are rich and wealthy, and we just don't know it. You know, I think Grenada has a lot more wealth than the CBI funds. This place is so blessed. <laughs> Hang in there, buddy. Uh, Dexter Mitchell is saying good morning, and he's tuned in from PM. Oh, Pity Martinique. Well, hello there, Pity Martinique. We're coming to see you guys. By God's, by God's grace, we're going to be in Pity Martinique this year. We're going to be there. On Theorello says, since the powers that be claim it is the best run in all the CBI programs. Yes, Anthea? So? Okay. Yeah. I guess she means we must be doing pretty darn good. My, my, my. Here she is, Nesta. Nesta is chiming in, saying good morning, George, and all. Happy Sunday and health and peace. Peace of heart and God's richest blessings throughout 2020. Thank you, Nesta. You can never send enough of that our way. We appreciate not just me, but I'm sure the pilgrims out there appreciate that as well. Roger Mitchell. Say, hey, by the way, Nesta, say hi to the kids for me. Uh, Roger Mitchell is uh, saying good morning. And it's gray in Toronto with lots of snow. <laughs> Ding dong, ding dong, lots of snow. Charles Norma saying good morning. Devon Phillip, blessed morning to everyone in the chat room and a special blessing to the gentleman on the screen. Ha 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 ha. I guess that's moi. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin Carmichael Simon saying good morning. Jen George. Jen George. Who that? Hello, Jen. Not sure, but if you're a first timer, nice to have you here. Spread the word around and we look forward to a lot of visits from you. Jen is saying, uh, how are you? I'm, I'm just fine, Jen. And now seeing you there makes me even finer. Kipling Francis sending his blessings as always. Lennox, hello. <laughs> Lennox John saying, morning, George. Blessed Sunday. Have a great one. Thank you very much, Mr. John. Long time no see. And it's an honor having you out there in the audience this morning. Eric Stone Mitchell. Eric, let's forget about the Eric part. Stone Mitchell. Any relation? Don't go day, Judge. Carlene Vesprey is showing up. Hello, Carlene. Where's your hubby this morning? And uh, Erica Mitchell is wishing everybody a happy Sunday. So, nice to see all of you folks here. It's so encouraging to see these names popping up there. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be a lot more joining us as the morning goes on. So, uh, Jen George says, Geneva George, this is <laughs> uh, I guess I can read that on the air. Why not? Jen George says, Geneva George, this is Pisides X. <laughs> How could I forget? How could I forget? Oh, hello, Pisides X. Nice to see you. You owe us a visit, you know. Um, Eric Stone Mitchell. <laughs> 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 
this is going to be a long day. <laughs> this is going to be a long day. A little while ago, I was asking uh, Eric Stone Mitchell if there's any relation between him and the Stone Mitchell. <laughs> he responds here, hell no. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Keep it up, guys. I need the humor. <laughs> I really need the humor. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, I think uh, that's it on social media for the time being. Let me take a little break here. We'll come back with the buzz. Inspection and licensing have begun, and at Hotbuds, we want you to be ready. From January to February 15th, we're offering vehicle owners with single registration letters 1 to 2,500 and plural registration letters 1 to 250, 10% off our new torque tires and power max batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at our motor department in Mungay or our tire bay in Grand Dance, located near Hubbard's Building Supplies. I'm always on the move. Training, traveling, competing. So it's good to know I have Quad Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing e-banking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Corporate Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our Spice Island. Friendlich. Energizing our Grenada. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com when you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. A little while ago, I uh, acknowledged the presence of Carlene Vesprey, and I was wondering where where is Carlene's husband this morning? You know, they usually show up together. You know, happy, loving couple. Well, he's just shown up here. Mr. Bradley has shown up, saying good morning. Um, two, 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 two. Let's see who else has popped up. Maria St. Bernard is there this morning saying good morning to uh, her fellow listeners. Nice to see you guys. Now, I also see, well, 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 look at who's here. Beverly Sinclair. Beverly, good morning. I trust that you're in Grenada and that everything's fine. Beverly is, she's not on the forum, but she's there incognito. And um, Beverly, we're still working on that issue, girl. We hope to get Mekwe Chat back on the air, ASAP. Mekwe Chat, for those of you who, is there anybody who doesn't know about Mekwe Chat? Every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, we get together. Um, you got folks out there in New York, in London, St. Vincent, Dominica, St. Kitts. Jamaica, Grenada, wherever, people all over the place who we get together for a two-hour session on Thursday nights, make we chat, taking a look at not just things here in Grenada, but around the region, and boy, that's one heck of a program. Beverly is the uh, producer, and uh, we have not brought that to you now for the last couple of weeks because of some technical difficulties we're having here. We need a, a good computer, hey? Eh? And uh, we're hoping to get a good, compu good computer real soon, okay? And the moment we have it, we'll be back up. 
Uh, so yes, Beverly is one of the people out there this morning who's in. Well, she's not incognito. She's now chimed in. Uh, ta -da -da -da. Mickelman Alexander. Uh, I wonder if uh, Mickelman Alexander is the same as Michael Alexander. Michael is saying good morning, George and class. Happy Sunday to everyone and God's blessings. That is all. Timothy, hello, my favorite pharmacist. Timothy Scantlebury is there this morning. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Let me see who else. Ram Rod is saying good morning to everyone. Hope we're having a great day so far, Yemen. Davini Leo says good morning, class. Lots of new classmates. Happy to be in with everyone. It's another beautiful day. Happy to be in the land of the living. Ya Davini Mwatu. And I mentioned that Bev is uh, now saying hi. Uh, Bob Marishow. Oh, what a tangled web we weave in Grenada. When first practice, when first practice to deceive, Sir Walter Scott, circa, circa 1808, last uttered by the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the USA, Nancy Pelosi, had me thinking all week. Mr. Marshall, wheel and come again. You got me totally confused there. Eric Stone Mitchell saying good morning. George, the men from the authentic side of the family. <laughs> I usually stand above six feet. <laughs> I told you we were in for a long ride this morning, eh? Mr. Mitchell says, George, the men from the authentic side of the family usually stand above six feet tall in the region of 200 plus pounds and wear 12 plus shoes. And, and that's a fact. Eric Ewing will lead me into temptation this morning. No siree, no siree. Georgie ain't going there. Georgie ain't going there. Uh, Beverly says, looking forward to getting back on air with Mick, we chat, girl, not just you and me. Thursday nights, I don't know what the heck to do with myself. Tessa Barry saying good morning and wishing everybody a great Sunday. Timothy Scantlebury has finally broken his silence. You know, I've been watching this guy sitting there incognito for a couple of weeks now. Never said anything. Well, he has finally broken his silence. Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Erica Mitchell is dying with laughter here. Now, let me try and put two and two together. We have a, the Vespre couple, right? And I'm wondering if we also have the Mitchell couple. There's an Eric Mitchell on there, Eric Stone Mitchell. And I see now an Erica Mitchell, who's just dying with laughter. Am I to assume that you two are a pair, a couple, or just brother and sister? Eric and Erica, what a coincidence, you know, to marry somebody named Erica or to marry somebody named Eric, if your name is Erica. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I don't know. Damien Val McLeod is saying, I am missing it really bad, and I guess Damien is referring to Mequi Chat. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. For those of you who haven't yet checked out this program, join us on Thursday nights, 8 to 10, and just in case you're not able to do that, also go to the uh, grenadabroadcast.com website where it's archived. All the programs we've done in the past uh, year, I think, are 
on there. Okay. Eric Stone Mitchell. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Eric Stone Mitchell says, siblings, George. Thank you for clarifying that. Isn't that a coincidence? Couple? Brother and sister? Do we have any aunties and uncles? Well, show up if you're there, my friends. And uh, Ramrod says, they're brother and sister. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I wasn't sure what the word siblings meant. Yeah? I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding you. Uh, Dexter Mitchell says, that's Eric's twin sister. Ramrod says, twins actually, very, very nice people. So, hey, hey, hey. we got a team here. Erica Mitchell, Eric Mitchell, then it seems like Dexter Miller knows them, Ramrod knows them. Um, and then here, here's another Mitchell who's just popped up. Roger Mitchell says, uh, Gregory, Grenada has lots of Mitchells. Sorry, not Gregory, Georgie. Yeah, Georgie, that's me. Grenada has lots of Mitchells, indeed. We do, <laughs> we do have a lot. Now you guys are trying to drag me into something. I ain't going there. Ernesto was saying, uh, good morning, Gigi and family. Welcome to class 2020. Hey, <laughs> class 20, I like that. Class 2020. All right, pilgrims. Carlisle Patrice has also uh, shown up incognito there so far. Martin Ken Lewis is incognito. Delirious McQueen is there. Uh, Jackie O, we've seen. Clara Batiste, nice to see you guys. Henry Steele, I think Mr. Steele is in Kerryco, could be wrong. Agatha Jordan, hello there, our good friend Agatha. Anytime you want to see something enlightening on uh, Facebook, go see Agatha. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gemma Monica Hunt is also there. T.F. Richard says, go over there. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, never mind what I guess. All right, pilgrims. Now, our opening scripture this morning. We've been laughing since we started at nine, right? That's uh, what, 33 minutes ago? Let's get serious now for a couple of minutes. We're going to laugh again. Our opening scripture this morning comes to you from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verses 11 to 20, which says, Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain of smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. 
Once again, they're reading Exodus 20, verses 11 to 20. Check it out. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Ronnie Gittens is saying good morning. Agatha Jordan says, good morning, my dear George. Oh, I'm so honored. I'm dear to Agatha. Never met the lady, but I'm just dear to her. She's a lovely lady. Happy Sunday. Carly Patrice and Henry Steele, we are all kayaks and so proud of it. Stay blessed, my dear, to you too, Agatha, and your sons. I don't know if you have daughters. I don't recall ever seeing daughters, your daughters on Facebook, but I know that you have really, really nice sons. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Peter Bishop says, the only commandment with a promise. Nice reading, George. Hey, Pedro, I see you. I'm watching you on Facebook, and I see you quoting scriptures as well. That's nice, my friend. That's nice. We need a few more like you around. Jackie O says, Peter Bishop, top of the morning to you. Hope you're staying warm. Bowen Kenny is with us. Florence Richards, Bowen and Florence are both incognito so far. Uh, ta -da, ta -da. <laughs> Peter Bishop says, I thought I was the original kayak. Ah, uh, yeah. Hey, Peter, if and when, not if, but when we do make that trip to, uh, both trips actually, the one to Pity Martinique and the one to Karakou this year, right? you better be with us, better be with us. I want you to show me some of the nooks and crannies that I am yet to discover up there. Uh, Roger Mitchell says 5-9. <laughs> Dogo de, Dogo de. Uh, Jackie O is saying yes indeed. Uh, okay, I think that's it for the time being. I read the scriptures, yeah. Okay, so break time. And then uh, we'll come back with the editorial from the new today. Hey, Lynn. Hey, neighbor. Here's the bill I asked you to pay for me. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LEDs. They burn less energy, right? Much less. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. And Greenleck is always advising us not to open the fridge too often. That's right. And my family washes and irons in bulk. With fuel prices changing all the time, how do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. So while Grenada can't control fuel prices, I can conserve energy and save money. Grenelec, energizing our Grenada. Conveniently located in the Grand Anne Shopping Center, for over 40 years, Food Fair has provided quality service at affordable prices. Now, grocery shopping is made easier and more convenient from the Food Fair web store. Hey, babe. Hmm? Listen, uh, I need you to go down to Food Fair to get some groceries. All right, no problem. Right away. Thanks, babe. 
What are you doing? You're supposed to be going to Food Fair to get a grocery mat. I am. But didn't you know you can order your groceries online from the Food Fair web store? Are you serious? Of course. All you have to do is just to log on to www.foodfair.gd with credit card in hand and with an order of $100 or more, Food Fair Granans will deliver up to three miles away. And you don't even have to worry about your information, you know. The safety measures are excellent. So hold on. You just order online and Food Fair will deliver to you? Yep. Oh baby, better hurry up and order, man. <laughs> I already did. They should be here any minute now. Enjoy easy online shopping anytime from your home or office from the Food Fair web store. Food Fair, where you can fill your baskets without emptying your pockets. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Alrighty, folks, just before I uh, fire up the new today, um, Roger Mitchell is clarifying for us that he's part of the Mitchell family from River Sally. Uh, um, Steve, hello there, Stephen. Stephen, Stephen Fletcher. Thanks again, Stephen, for joining us a couple of weeks ago. Boy, we're looking forward to getting you back here in a heartbeat. Stephen and I are working on something which I think is going to really, really, really impress you. So hold on. Um, and in addition to that, Peter Bishop saying top of the morning to you. Peter, uh, Stephen is saying good morning, pilgrims. Enjoy your Sunday with GG. Well, I hope that you enjoy this, and I believe that you will, Stephen. I don't know if I should use the word enjoy, because uh, I know you're going to be very interested in the two media conferences that we're going to play in just a couple of minutes, but I don't know how good can you feel about a lot of what you heard or will be hearing. So leave it there for the time being. Um, to, to Ken Youngblood has popped up. Uh, but Ken is still incognito. Now, my dear friends, the editorial which appeared in Friday's edition of The New Today is captioned, Inadequate Resources. The two most recent devastating fires in the parish of St. George should awaken the powers that be to come to the realization that the fire department excuse me, of the Royal Grenada Police Force needs more firefighting tools and equipment to do an effective job in fighting fires in the country. It is one thing for politicians to boast about progress and development under their watch, but that can be destroyed within a matter of minutes, especially in the city given its terrain and the fire department that is badly lacking in terms of financial resources. The harsh reality of the situation was underscored on Wednesday at a police press conference by head of the fire department on the Carinage, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Glenroy Corion. The fire chief lamented the lack of adequate and sufficient fire tenders to deal with the types of fires that ran through the four buildings on Grenville Street last Thursday, and the other serious fire on Williamson Road two days later. ASB Corian also admitted that there was a shortage of water hydrants in the immediate vicinity of the city to deal with fires. This falls within the domain of the state-run National Water and Sewerage Authority, NAWASA, of Christopher 
Beef Husbands and Minister of Public Utilities, Gregory Bowen. RGPF will also have to review its own operational system to combat fires, not only in the city, but elsewhere on the island. It is not acceptable that some 46 years after independence, the fire department has to consistently wait on a crew to arrive from Grand Lake to remove power from a building on fire so that firefighters can get into action. This problem surfaced once again in the Grenville Street Fire as the firefighters were on the scene and had to wait for approximately one hour for Grenlick to arrive to disconnect the electricity in that area in order that the firemen could get into action. This is too primitive in the modern era of 2020. The fire department should have trained personnel within its ranks to move to remove electricity from any building on the island that is engulfed in flames. And the police high command should ensure that these persons remain within the fire department on a permanent basis and not be subjected to transfer to other sections of the force to engage in non-fire related activities. Unfortunately, Commissioner Martin was not able to give any figure about the finances that are allocated to the fire department from the 2020 budget set aside by government for the police force. The new today has a feeling that the budget for fire is below par. As ASP Corian indicated, many more resources are needed to put our firefighters in a better position to effectively do their jobs. This newspaper issues a call to the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security, Dr. Keith Mitchell, to allocate a certain percentage of the monies received from the selling of passports under the Citizenship by Investment Program to the police force, including the fire department. Over the years, the Mitchell-led government has not accounted to Grenadians on what precisely it has done with its share of the CBI funds and even the oil. Our citizens are kept in total darkness and do not know if the CBI funds collected by government are commingled in the consolidated fund and used from time to time to pay salaries of public officers. The frightening situation with fire adds to the already bad health care system on the island and the road infrastructure that is rapidly collapsing under the NNP watch. The sad state of affairs also comes at a time when Grenada will be entering the dry season, which in recent years was noted for many bushfires. The new today would also like to make some passing comments on reports that retired civil servant Beryl Isaac, who stepped down as cabinet secretary less than two weeks ago, is now being assigned by the powers that be to become the new head of the Public Service Commission. Is that the best the government can do? Why are they recycling so many retired public officers into key positions in the service? It appears that the current government is not attracting new blood into its fold.
and is forced to bring back a number of retirees. Last week, it was Carlton Darker Frederick, a known political activist of the ruling New National Party, who was brought out of retirement and sent to take charge as head of the physical planning unit within the Ministry of Finance of Prime Minister Mitchell. Mr. Frederick admitted that he did not get a letter of appointment from the PSC to assume the duties at the department, but did show up for work at its Lagoon Road office. This is the same Carlton Frederick who left the PPU many years ago as its head after he had difficulties with the previous PSC. And this is also the same individual who is the treasurer of the ruling party and executive member of the NNP St. John constituency branch and receives a monthly rent from government for use of his downstairs building that is rented out to the electoral office of the constituency. When will this sad state of affairs come to an end in Grenada, Kariakou, and Petty Martinique? Okay. That is the editorial which appeared in uh, Friday's edition of the new today. As I mentioned, no, uh, nothing from uh, our friend Little Angel this morning. Hope she's getting some well-deserved rest. Let me, now I haven't been reading the comments because I've been reading the prompter. So let me get back here now and see uh, what's there. Okay. Oh, boy, you guys have been dumping a lot of stuff there. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, okay. Alistair Warwood is saying good morning, Uncle George. I didn't know I had nephews and nieces and what have you. Roger Mitchell says, yes, but I'm going back to my grandmother's roots. We moved from River Sally to Paradise, then Telescope. Florence Edwards says, good morning, George. Yes, I was incognito, but thanks for the mention. Love your program. Thank you very much, Florence. Nice to have you. Keep coming. Ryan Jaman says, leaking firefighters hose <laughs> hoses. Yeah, you know, talking about hoses... Listen to that press conference, because you're going to hear, you are going to hear how many hoses the fire department has. Doop. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ryan says, streets in Grenada should, streets in Grenada should have electricity cut off switches known to cops and firefighters. Tessa Barry says, this discussion about the inadequacy regarding the resources of the fire department is very timely, given the predictions for this dry season. I do hope the authorities are listening. Kathleen Thomas says, <laughs> morning. Morning, all. Better late than never. Good to see you, Kathleen. Uh... Eric Pounder says, that is nonsense. The only Grenelic have... Take a deep breath, George. Only Grenelic has the authority to disconnect power. No way in the world the fire department has the authority to disconnect power. Ryan says, let Miss Isaac be in her retirement. Uh, big question mark there. Uh, T.F. Richard says, Beryl, and I'm assuming he's meaning Beryl Isaac, 
has to further exercise the vindictive and sinister intentions of the regime. Oh, I see. So that's the reason why she's back, eh? All right, that's a matter of opinion. Uh, Margaret Francis says, Roger Mitchell, okay. Are you related to Shirley? Alistair Warwood says, oil, gas. The money's collected from the CBI project. That and a green donkey you will never see in Grenada. Trust me, <laughs> a green donkey. Okay. Uh, Benedict Cador says, read the fire. Do we do electrical inspections of buildings for code? Listen to the press conference coming up. Yeah. TF says, George, it's not what they can't, it's not that they can't attract new folks. The master just likes to have his loyal dogs at his footstool until he's ready to spit them out. Sounds like you're very much aware of the political picture. Uh, okay, folks, I'll tell you what. Whew, quite the morning. Break time, and then we will return with part one of that media conference from the Royal Grenada Police Force. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our spice island. Friendlek, energizing our Grenada. I'm always on the move. Training, traveling, competing. So it's good to know I have Quap Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing eBanking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Cooperative Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Welcome home. Inspection and licensing have begun. And at Hotbots, we want you to be ready. From January to February 15th, we're offering vehicle owners with single registration letters 1 to 2,500 and plural registration letters 1 to 250, 10% off our new torque tires and power max batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at our motor department in Mungay or our tire bay in Grand Dance, located near Hubbard's Building Supplies. Alrighty, folks. Let's see here. Ooh, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, okay. Pilgrims, uh, ta -ta, ta -ta. Pele Darbo is saying a blessed Sunday morning. Uh, Ryan wants to know where Andos is. Ryan, there are a lot of, the, there are several Andos. Uh, there's one on Melville Street right next to uh, the bus terminus. There's one on the, uh, actually there was on the, uh, Melville Street. That's now been sold to uh, Huggins, I understand. They had the uh, restaurant on the upper tier, and on the lower tier, they had the uh, supermarket. On the Carinage, you'll find uh, the supermarket. There's also one in Parade, which is on the way up to St. Paul. Then, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. There's also uh, one, I think, in Springs. Yeah? They're all over the place, okay? Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. 
Now, I see here we have now been joined by Nadia Tongor. Hello, Nadia. Haven't seen you, young lady. Sure hope I do before you go. Uh, Terrence Williamson is there this morning. Good morning, Terrence. Good to see you. Lydia James is with us as well. And I didn't know that we had, uh, you remember that television show Gilligan's Island? Looks like we have uh, part of the Gilligan team in here this morning. Michael Gilligan. Hello, Michael. Celebrity. Love to meet you sometime, too. Okay. Let's get down to serious business now, folks. I want you to listen carefully. Listen carefully. This week, Commissioner of Police and his entourage held a, a media conference up at uh, Fort George. Right off the bat, you'll hear the concerns expressed by the commissioner, by the way, the sort of start that we have gotten off to here in Grenada in 2020. He elaborates, and then uh, towards the end of the first part of this uh, file that I'm going to play, and when we play the second file, you'll hear a number of questions and a number of concerns that were raised by members of the media. So let's go with uh, part one. Since the start of 2020, we have witnessed a series of tragic and heart-wrenching incidents, beginning with our first road fatality, followed by a series of fires which destroyed businesses, homes, and homes. We literally witnessed people's lives and livelihood being reduced to ashes in a matter of hours and in some instances, minutes. Following this, we had the shocking and horrific news of a shooting incident which resulted in the death of Lanisha Stafford, a 16-year-old child in what can be described as chilling circumstances. In this regard, one Chiron Chaitan, a 30-year-old farmer of Carrier St. Andrew, has been arrested and charged for non-capital murder, murder in relation to this incident. My sympathy goes out to the individuals, families, and communities directly impacted by these heartbreaking incidents. As a consequence, in providing a law enforcement perspective on these incidents, I will caution that we must be aware that most of these <coughs> incidents are under active investigation and care must be taken not to say anything that may negatively impact the process of investigation or amount to pre-trial prejudices for matters which may be taken before the court. As it relates to the fatal motor vehicle accident, our investigation shows that speeding was clearly a factor. I therefore want to once again <coughs> appeal to the motoring public to exercise greater caution in the use of our roads. I urge you to be cognizant of the increase in the volume of vehicles on our roads, drive defensively, and be guided by the traffic laws of our country and comply with the speed limit at all times. In taking these precautions, you may be aware that the life you may save might very well be your own. In the case of the Grenville Street Fire, the fire department responded and was on the scene of this fire within minutes of receiving the report. However, as explained previously, there was a delay in the commencement of fire suppression because the affected buildings were energized by electricity, which as you can appreciate, pose life-threatening danger to the responding officers. Following the Grenville Street fire, the RGPF took the initiative to call an emergency meeting with officials from the General Hospital, Grenleck, and officers from the Fire Department to review the relevant issues and to determine the measures that can be taken and to put in place as a means of improving our response protocols. The following preliminary decisions were taken at that meeting. One, 
all major incidents of fire and accidents should have a joint stakeholder response. Two, the need for joint exercises among stakeholders. Three, the sharing of information. And four, a joint <coughs> notification protocol. The details for operationalizing and improving this multi-agency response mechanism will be fleshed out in subsequent meetings among the stakeholders. There will be a follow-up meeting with Grenleck at 2 p.m. today to further examine the circumstances of the Grenville Street Fire with a view to gaining greater clarity and understanding of all the factors occurring on that unfaithful day, as well as enhancing our collaborative response capabilities and cooperation. With regard to the Williamson Road fire, the arrival of the fire plants was delayed by a few minutes due to parked vehicles which obstructed the part of the appliance. I must however hasten to indicate that our fire department constitutes well-trained and professional individuals who has consistently delivered on its mandate providing the highest standard of service to the people of this country, given their capability. I acknowledge that the department has challenges, but I assure you that the availability of hose is not one of them. As a matter of fact, the department currently has in excess of 175 new hose in stock and follows a very strict protocol of inspection and replacement of damaged equipment, not just hose, following every mission. The fire department also have been very proactive in addressing existing challenges and building redundancies through a number of initiatives. I name a few. One, collaboration with external stakeholders, which includes NAWASA, the St. George's University, and the Airport Authority for building redundancy in our capacity to deliver and support the fire in the execution of its mission at any, set, at any fire. We've also had the establishment of a voluntary firefighters unit, which currently constitutes 30 members and who have been doing an outstanding job supporting the fire department. Additionally, we are in the process currently of recruiting 15 additional officers to further strengthen this department for the dry season. The department continues to undertake a number of fire prevention initiatives, which include media programs to educate the public on fire prevention, 27 of which was done in 2019. Monthly inspections of fire hydrants the last of which was done on November 17, 2019. Effective ones are routinely reported to NAWASA. Fire drills with businesses and organizations, 22 was conducted in 2019. Building inspections and servicing of extinguishers, 56 buildings were inspected in 2019. Additionally, Although Grenada remains a relatively peaceful and safe country, I wish to express deep concern about the level of violence in general, and specifically the acts of violence against our women and children. I cannot sit comfortably when adults continue to sexually abuse minors, especially those under the age of 16. I cannot sit comfortably when 84 of 181 cases before our High Court are sexual crimes, many of which involve victims under the age of 16. And currently, 10 of the 26 newly added cases to the list of the High Court are also sexual nature. I cannot sit comfortably, ladies and gentlemen, when friends and loved ones cause harm to each other, and in some cases death, over minor matters 
which should be resolved peacefully. As a consequence, the RGPF will intensify its effort to combat sexual and violent crimes this year. These challenges, as you are aware, are multifaceted and multidimensional in nature <coughs> and require a collaborative and national response. As a nation, we need to build a coalition against criminality in all its forms. While the RGPF plays a leading role in maintaining law and order, our success and Grenada's success in this regard requires the cooperation of the general public. Notwithstanding the progress made, there is much to be done. So I appeal to the community, if you hear something or see something, please say something and report it to the police. We must all help to safeguard our status <coughs> as a peaceful and stable country. This is not hearsay. Statistics and comparative level criminal activity show that Grenada remains a safe nation. However, as a people, we need to become more security and safety conscious on the individual and community level. Accidents, fires, and other incidents can occur at any time, but it is our responsibility to reduce the risk of such. In this context, I want to appeal to the general public to take responsibility to mitigate your personal risk factors and to continue to support the RGPF in keeping Grenada safe. In conclusion, and looking forward to this year 2020, the RGPF has a number of planned initiatives, which include the enhancement of our carry secure police records information and management system across the force, the strengthening of our community policing programs, the formalization of our CCTV Safer Cities initiative, the, re the re final recruitment of 30 traffic wardens to complete the complement of 60, steps to strengthen our Coast Guard, and the distribution of our first round of medals and ribbons to officers, recognizing officers for good conduct and long service, just to name a few. With this, I thank you for your patience and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Hours are really long time to wait to, to, to begin fire suppression and uh, the public I think is, is very concerned about, about that, that hour is it, frightening people. So and I know that you're still in discussions with the stakeholders, but can you give us some early indications as to why it took an hour to get Greenland, which is located minutes away actually from that fire event to get it. Early indications. So what is it looking like? As, as soon as um, I can question some of the phrases used in your comments, but it will be presumptuous to question that at this stage before having <coughs> all of the facts that I can give you a very comprehensive response to that statement. All right, so we, we, we must investigate it. It's a critical issue that we need to get to the bottom of, but we must investigate it, have all the facts in order to provide you with an appropriate response. Is anyone really being questioned as it relates to this cause of the fire? Because I'm understanding that there was some maybe homeless person that would have called. I'm not, I'm, that's yes, yeah. I'm asking you for confirmation. Fire investigation? Anybody in question? Fire right. investigation is on going. And what's your question again? Well, just, just basically that. If you have anybody, anyone. Anyone? In no, there's no one in for questioning as it relates to that fire at this stage. All right, a question about the killing in St. Andrews. You spoke around sex charm, sexual abuse, and child and women. I want to know, um, I know your investigation is ongoing, but do you have any, um, is there a reason for speaking specifically to those um, 
child sexual abuse with domestic I mean, abuse yeah. against women. Is, there, is that related to the case? As the no, as, as, uh, certainly not as related to the case, but you will realize I spoke about CCTV and safer cities. Mm -hmm. I spoke about Karasiko Prim's system. As Commissioner coming into a press brief for, for the first time of the year, I think it will be a cheat for me to just focus narrowly on one circumstances and not give a broad um, coverage of where law enforcement issues lie and what seems to be of critical concern to us. Because I also spoke about violence as well, um, with respect to the number of harm offenses that we are having. So I thought it prudent, yes, we've had the, the most recent issues, the fires in particular and the accidents, but I thought it wise as well to give an overview of other factors at different dimensions that are of concern to law enforcement at this time, and to leverage the media's um, input to impact that, feed that out to the community so that we can get assistance in those areas as well. But it's not necessarily um, particularly concerned in that incident. But if you have incident, information of the nature as it relates to that incident, consistent with what your question says, I will be happy to receive it. Good morning, everyone. Nisha Paul, the new today newspaper. Um, in terms, in relation to the Williamson Road fire, there were there were speculations that an elderly woman would have died from smoke inhalation. Um, can you confirm the cause of death of the of the elderly woman? Is it part of your investigation? Yes. Um. In dealing with the Williamson Road fire, yes, um, one by the name of Vito Paul Joseph died, 92 year old. Um, the cause of death, as indicated by the uh, pathologist, revealed she died from asphyxia due to smoke inhalation. Um, currently, investigation is ongoing into this matter. So that's the most I can say about it. Speaking about cause of death, can you speak to the cause of death as it relates to death here in Billy as it from the autopsy? <laughs> yes. Um, <coughs> the cause of death, she died from a gunshot wound. It's a co Yeah. Okay. Was the gunshot here in the tree? The mm -hmm. gun, the bullet you shot? Um. I don't want to speak too much about that investigation, as I indicated earlier. Um, the matter is still under investigation, so I do not want to give too much information. As I indicated earlier, you've heard already that an individual is arrested in this matter. Um, so obviously, this is a matter going to court. Um, the police always have to guard on the side of caution of releasing pretrial prejudices. Um, there is still the ongoing work in this case. But of course, the CID will be limited in the amount of information they can divulge on these matters. All right, fine. Thank you for the concern. Can you provide an update on the um, investigation, in investigations into the first road accident? Is it likely that any charges will be made? In fairness to her, in fairness to her, the accident involved more than one party. And certainly a person died, it does not mean that the investigation dies as well. Um, I have not had a summation on that investigation as to whether or not charges will be preferred to the other party or not involved in that accident. So that is still not submitted um, as yet. So who was speeding? Who was yeah, speeding? Yeah, exactly. speeding was involved. Who was speeding? Speeding was involved in the accident. All right. Okay. As a matter of fact, the matter is still being investigated. It's not summated, and it will be presumptuous again to a lie <coughs> blame anyway. If I lay blame on one side, it means that you already um, exclude the other side from any possible blame. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. You don't be worried because it's not any question that will embarrass anybody. But it's just to get information. Yes, sir. Now, what is the size? of the 2020 budget for RDPF. And out of that, what is allocated for the fire department? And is that adequate for them to do the things that they're supposed to do? Well, the fire department is a part 
of the RGPF as an entity. And there is no line, line item for the fire departments in our budget. The needs of the fire department is met as part of the allocations made to the RGPF, like we will allocate to traffic, to Coast Guard, to SSU, etc. But I think where this question is going is whether or not the fire department is adequately resourced. <coughs> and if that is where the question is going, I will be the first to say no. The fire department is not adequately resourced, and certainly we do need, um, critically, some assistance to lift the standard of fires of the fire, the fire department. The guys are doing well in the area and the performance of the duties given their capabilities, but certainly we need to relook how greater support can be given to enhance the capability of that department. The first part of the question is, what was the size of the technical budget for police? You didn't answer that. I, I, well, what is the 2020 budget? I budget? cannot give you the final fixed figure, mm -hmm. but it is in the 50 million range. Mm -hmm. It is in the 50 million range. Um, I, I can clarify the exact figure and provide that to you. Uh, that is not. Yes, I need it. Yes, I need it. Yes. That's why I'm asking. Yes. Now, as regards the capital budget for the police, I don't want expenditure not to pay salaries, but capital and capital set for the development. What is it? As as I've said, I will have to get back to the the, the um the expenditures, mm -hmm. um, revenue and expenditures, and provide that that information. Don't need the information. Now, as regards the water hydrant in the city, mm -hmm. now I presume that you have to be working along with Gwenlick. Do we have sufficient water hydrants in town to deal with fires? Do we have sufficient, and in strategic areas? Because there was thought that when the fire hit Gwenlick Street, you had to get water somewhere quite down by Ace. So are there sufficient hydrants in the city and are they strategically located to deal with fires? Yeah, they, they, I think it is probably now Sayo the one to indicate that we work with as it relates to hydrants. Um, so well, you need it. Korean, <coughs> uh, well, you need no, it we work with we work with with Nawasa as it relates mm -hmm. to hydrants, not Grand Lake. Mm -hmm. No, um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a minor, not an issue. Water, so. But but yes, um, hydrants are critical. Mm -hmm. We treat and respond to hydrants as a very critical support to the fire mechanism. As a matter of fact, hydrants assist with quick refilling as as um, and we can also connect into hydrants to use them for fire suppression activities as well. And hence the reason why we have regular monthly inspections to ensure that they are maintained as best as can be, um, so to support our, our operations. Um, in terms of determining if these hydrants are strategically located to dissect the question, mm -hmm. is determining on what an individual might be categorizing as relevant and appropriate. And I would want to think that a whole term should be considered in that, and not that you're located against a primary business as against somebody's home, and the, the hydrant should be located in this context to support that. Um, whether or not we have an adequate amount <coughs> to support, we will need to study that. But certainly what is capable is that all of our fire appliances carry extra holes on them so that if we need to connect to a hydrant at a distance, you're coupling the hoses, you're connecting to it, and you're feed from it. Whether or not with the development of St. George's and expansion of the area and the size of buildings and, and businesses that we do have, we need to have more units. I think that's a study we will need to do to come to that determination. I would like to hear from the fire chief on that. He would be more appropriate to answer the question. I know you give me a general thing, to that. but let, I would like to hear from him as to whether or not it is yeah. adequate and whether or not they are strategically located in the city I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the city. I will say definitely we need more hydrants within the town to do our operation. 
development taking place, people will business around, homes around, and we need more hydrants. As indicated, we do our monthly inspections. We find some of the hydrants being defective. We normally report to Nawasa, and they do follow up to get them back in operation. But as you see, and I can see, definitely we need more hydrants to protect the citizens of this country. Mm -hmm. Mr. Commissioner, we also see in, in the city in particular, taller buildings are being erected. We have the resources within the fire department to tackle fires in these taller buildings that are erected. I will defer the question again to the fire chief. At least you tell me you prefer the answer from him. <laughs> 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 Once we get the information, so, that's what I mean. And if necessary, if necessary, I will come back on his yes, answer. Yes, yes, right. yes, yeah. Right. Uh, as we stand at present, we have fighting capability. We have response capability in terms of a ladder, pitching a ladder, according to the height of the building. But we do need trucks that equip with ladders to reach some of the height to do our work more effectively. Mm -hmm. We do need, we don't have at this present, only the airport equipped with such. We don't have. You recently bought some fire trucks. Was there any consideration given to that aspect of it? to buy the trucks that can be able to call it Because you, if you pass on the car now, you see new trucks. Shortly I see a new truck there, but was there any yeah, kind of given? A water tanker. A water tanker. Yes, yes, sir. But specs were sent to see if we could push on that effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I hope people are yeah, listening, yeah. so they will. Part of, part, of the, part of the redundancy in the fire response mechanism is to try to have collaboration with stakeholders. And I think there are a few private persons you collaborate with as well, yes, sir. particularly in the dry season. And that's why I'm going back to the point you raised with the, the tanker. The strategy is rather than having a fire truck having to leave a scene to refill and not do suppression, you can have a chain of supply tanker trucks providing um, the water and so that is needed to keep fire suppression sustainable. Um, hence the, the, the support we have with SGU um, and a lot of private uh, water trucks actually work with us in this regard, mainly in the dry season to assist in that kind of suppression. So we thought that the fire department also needs some in-house capability for initial deployment that a tanker can go out with the truck to assist with an immediate um, resupply to the truck rather than having to leave the scene in terms of getting um, resupply. Um, and while we wait for our stakeholder response and collaboration to support the department. Are our trucks more suited to fight good fire than, let's say, applying it on the property? Same the trucks we have. The trucks we have, um, are they more appropriate for dealing with good fire than a fire in the city with buildings? I, I don't know. I mean, you're already experts. Well, um, so what I should say definitely is a durable process. What we need is that trucks that have water and could carry foam. So we have to go in that direction. We have to have trucks with capacity, tanks to hold water and the foam. So in going forward, that is what we are looking forward to achieve. But they could serve both entities at present. What we have could, so depends on the type of fire, what is burning in a particular structure. Can our trucks deal with seawater? Because many years ago, um, before they expanded the drum, when the street was just, as soon as you cross in down the street and you go on to where the street, you could have got the seawater here. Coming down the parallel, you get in water. The trucks we have, can they utilize the seawater? Yes, they could. We could draft from the sea, mm -hmm. which you call the hard water. It could use for suppression, for our fighting purposes. 
That could be done. Once we get a good source, that could be done. So maybe we probably need to look more in that direction than Navasa. Because you see, water is always there. It's all Navasa depends. water is not always it's there. It all depends on the location of the fire at the time. If I may ask a question, please, sir. Sorry to go in here. Just, to just before we take a question, they, we cannot look at any one mechanism in building capacity. The more you have, the better. Mm -hmm. So you have to have all on board and you have layers of redundancy that fortifies your position mm -hmm. to be able to deal with every particular situation. All right? Yes, sir. Yes, John here, GBM. Um, forgive my ignorance. In relation to the Williamson Road fire, um, this um, elderly individual who would have passed as a result of smoke inhalation, who was not directly, for whom was not directly affected by the fire, from my knowledge, um, can someone be held responsible for that? Held responsible for, <coughs> for her death. For her death. Mm -hmm. um, I think the investigation will have to reveal some form of liability. Um, and if there is liability, that someone commits a, 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 a crime that leads to a death, then yes. But you must have um, the proof of an offense being committed by an individual towards another, and the mens rea has to be established. Let me just ask here, how many form trucks do we have? Fire trucks. How much fire trucks we have? Oh. Yeah, and you could give, give me the total as well. How many fire trucks is the department that carries at, home and overall? At present, mm -hmm. the trucks we have on the outskirts, the rural areas, and the one at St. George, we have what we call an inline inductor. We don't have the tank capacity within that structure of the truck. We'll have to use the five gallon bottle of concentrate, use our inline inductor, send the water from the truck to create that foam, which will take a little time to do so. But as I said earlier, we're looking at getting trucks with the capacity, the tanks, with foam to push on that effect, make it much easier. So as we stand now, our trucks don't have the tank capacity. We have what we call inductors. The inductors to put into the five gallon bottle, send the water through to create what you call the foam. And how many trucks we have in all? Presently, we have six trucks and the house Functioning. Yes. <laughs> six functioning. Including the one in St. George's? Yeah. And is the airport equipped with their trucks? They're separate. So we have six uh, items. Just a clarification as, as we're speaking issues with fires and trucks. Um, oftentimes, I, I would like to know how many gallons your trucks, the capacity of it to carry, because oftentimes you hear the truck arrive and the truck doesn't have water and all these sorts of things yeah well that's the norm that's the norm i you know so i, I was the, just the, trying the to people. get an understanding as to how much gallons because i know one truck basically. right the capacity of the ones in georgia is 1800 gallons and that's a lot of water it all depends on how you dispose okay. of it please enjoy we'll take one last question as it, as it relates to the as it relates to the, um, the, the homicide, can any more details be provided in terms of the, the um, circumstances surrounding the death? And you mentioned that an individual was charged. Can you tell us when he would be appearing in court? Um, I cannot give you any information. As I alluded earlier, that um, this matter is under investigation. Um, what I can tell you, hopefully tomorrow morning, the individual will be taken to court. Defense. Can we give can we say what is the situation with an investigation of this promise into the of the of the legend we man? Who you know I think you know what I'm talking about. The legend man with the construction. With construction yes. Yeah. Because I know people have yeah. come to the police and yeah. filed certain complaints. Yeah. Yeah. So can you give us an update? Uh, 
and what is the situation with him and the movement? Yeah. What is the proof on the police end? Um, that matter is, is being handled by the FIU and not the RGPI. Not the RGPI. Um, so an update can be given to you as to the status of that investigation. Um, we can clarify with the FIU the status and give you that feedback. Please, please. Um, or something you can seek from FIU. If you want us to clarify, we can do that and have a feedback. That's why you don't speak. Say again? That's why you don't speak. You don't speak. No. Okay. We will seek to so, clarify the so status of that investigation and give you a feedback. And, one thing I will and I'm on camera, you. so I will, I will yes. do that. Yes. Yes. One thing I want to ask you. I know you, you all have developed a strategic plan for the police force. Yes. Right. Where are we with that? Have you we identified are, the funding to execute it? We are, we, are, we? Are, we, we are actually in the second round of our strategic plans. We've mm -hmm. executed the first one that was completed, and we now into the second phase. Um, our second strategic plan and all our plans are based not upon pie in the sky, but are planned around the realities that we have. Because if we develop any strategies without the capability of delivering on the strategies, it is useless. So we build practical strategies surrounding the resources that will be available to us to make them more substantive and achievable. Um, Actually, our first officers' meeting this year will be looking at re-examining where we have been um, for the first was 2017 was a review where we are where we are as of 2017 into 2020 in advancing the new strategic plan um, to see where we are and whether or not we need to restructure or if we are progressing as expected. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of this press brief. Oh, whoa, whoa. Ah, uh, yes, Grenada. Boy, I'll tell you, that sure worked up uh, a response from you folks, and I'm going to do my best to try and get, not all, not all, because some of them are, <sighs> try and get as many of them in as possible. Let's go all the way back. Um, by the way, we've been joined by a number of people over the past little while. Um, let's start with Eric Pounder. He says, for inspection, it is mandatory that the electrical inspectorate, uh -oh, where is that now, should reinspect buildings every five years. Well, I can't say whether or not that is done. Lydia James is saying good morning. Mary Campbell says, what utter nonsense, nonsense or trash about having to off? Chester Simon is joining us. Good morning, Chester. Stephanie Lord is asking, is he serious about hoses? <laughs> yeah, he's serious about the hoses, Stephanie. Anthony DeRigg says, the new hoses you have in stock, please pull some of them out and put them on the trucks. Uh, seems logical to me, Anthony. Uh, good morning, Mashida. Uh, and Shirley Simpson. Is that Shirley Simpson, the singer? I think I know her. Ernesto says, in the New York City Fire Department, there are trained electricians who can shut down the power in burning buildings and not have to wait for Con Ed. That's the main electric company in New York. Uh, to which Margaret responds, yay. But Ernesto, Grenada is not New York City. In my humble opinion, all that needs to happen is better coordination between the fire department and Grenlec. There should be an on-call person at work at Grenlec all the time. So in the event of a fire, Grenlec is notified immediately and they can flip the switch. Some things are not so complicated. Anthony DeRiggs says, criminality in all its forms. Well, some get more attention than others, it seems. 
Alistair Warwood says, we put at least 100 vehicles on our streets on a monthly basis. God only knows how many driver's licenses. Seems the more congested the roads get, the more idiotic we drive. Without the thought or concern for others. Lawlessness. Absolutely, Alistair. Ryan Jabon is asking question here. What was the 16-year-old MDC, I guess McDonald College, schoolgirl from Hermitage doing in Chaitin's home? Um, Shirley Simpson says, it took an hour? This is not very good. Come on, people. This is shameful. Yeah, yeah, Shirley. <laughs> and I guess regarding uh, Ryan's question here, but what was this kid doing in that man's place? Uh, Lydia James says, I want to know too. Peter Bishop says, I hope the commissioner of police cannot sit comfortably while phone gate is not investigated. I hope he cannot sit comfortably while some members of the police force are paid in lieu of vacation while others have to take their vacation. I hope he cannot sit comfortably while the allegations of sale of diplomatic passports go uninvestigated. I hope he cannot sit comfortably while Shrimp Farm is not investigated. You should be in the Bible, man. You're full of hope. <sighs> Eric Stone Mitchell says, Grenlick vehicles should be given sirens to use when necessary. Um, I won't comment on that because I don't know whether or not they do have uh, sirens. And I don't think the matter of having sirens had anything to do with the time it took to get that uh, electricity disconnected. Uh, Ernesto says, I think fire drills are unnecessary as was done in Gary's days and the revolution. Also, opening and running the fire hydrants to make sure they work properly. Seems like the matter was not enough fire hydrants, Ernesto. Uh, <laughs> Lydia James says uh, she's referring to Chaitin here, the person who apparently allegedly shot the skid. She says he's a farmer. Maybe she went for produce. <laughs> it's not a laughing matter. Shirley Simpson says, whoa. Very concerning, the points you brought up, dear. Let's hope all these things are not good and that it took an hour for a fire truck to respond to the fire. Grenada needs to do better. Shirley Simpson, I really don't think it took a, an hour for the fire department to respond to the fire. Um, while I think it may be a stretch, I did hear that they were on location within five minutes of uh, the flame. This fire supposedly started, excuse me, 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, they were there within five minutes, so that's not the issue. T.F. Richard says, the acting commissioner is smart. He was able to interject and answer the question levied at the fire chief, who was confused before he even attempted to answer the question. You noticed? You noticed? Uh, Arthur Langine wants to know what was this child doing in that house in order to get shot? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Margaret says, what the hell I hear here? There isn't a budget for the fire department? Somebody please tell me that I interpreted that wrong. You heard what was said, Max. 
You heard it with your own ears. Uh, Anthony DeRiggs is asking, any of the parishes without a fire truck? Well, Lydia James is quick to answer. She says, most of them. Uh, Alistair Warwood says, with a rate hike, Nawasa is getting this year. I hope that they have the upgrade of the hydrant system in the city in mind. Another hope. Okay. That person is just going to have to wait for just a little bit because I'm on the air. Uh... Anthony de Riggs says, anyone here remember the saying, it did not last as long as Williamson fire? I don't, Anthony. Probably before my time. T.F. Richard says, though we may be from a different mantle, or our children may not do such, we have to remember that there are kids who do what they want to get what they want even though some parents try. That's the society in which we live, not forgetting parents that send out their kids for whatever. And by the way, I was in charge of the Hermitage Police Station and knew the deceased and her family personally. And I, too, am surprised. Okie doke. John Franco, I told you there were a lot of comments. John Franco says, in the world of fire, there are lots of cities in the U.S. that will become sister cities that will train and help. Has that been done in Grenada? You know, I'm sure there are places we can get help with our fire needs, firefighting needs. I'm sure there are places... Good point, John. Margaret. Margaret says, read the hydrant situation. Once again, it shows the lack of development planning. Here you have development taking place in an old town with limited space, and no consideration is being given to the support and emergency services or equipment that will be needed to accommodate the changes. Ain't that it? Lack of foresight, lack of vision, lack of planning. John Franco says, also, firemen or women are certified. Is that done here as well? <laughs> uh, quality of certification? Maybe they have doctorates, like a senator? I don't know. Shirley Simpson says, you should write the story. Maybe then they will act together. Oh, oh first of all, Anthony DeRigg says, I should write a story on the fire truck in Grenada that was known as Halterback. <laughs> Halterback? Um, Shirley says, you should write the story. Maybe then they will get their act together. Uh, Jackie O says, even Ray Charles could see this panel is a joke. No one is taking responsibility, just making excuses. <laughs> you guys are a little bit too sharp for me this morning. Anthony DeRiggs says, it's a simple question. How many fire trucks? T.F. Richard says, the fire chief was asked how many foam trucks uh, they have and fire trucks in general. He went instead to say, how foam is made and used. <laughs> yeah. If you thought this press conference was funny, wait on the one coming up. 
<sighs> John Franco says there is a company called Pierce Fire Truck. They should try them. Lydia James says they have six trucks. Uh, let's see here. How many of them are in working condition? That's the question being asked by Lydia James. Arthur Langine responds by saying, God knows. Corley, you're going to have to wait. Alistair Warwood says, the government come and government go. And they all know that the firefighting system in Grenada is archaic. Yet, year after year, monies are cut from the budget because they don't care. Ah. Okay. We have a great relationship with the government of China. Why can't we ask them to donate the proper fire truck fully equipped and training for our firemen? Um, I'm not sure that uh, question is applicable here because when you walk around the carnage near the fire station, you see all kinds of fire trucks lined up in there. Um, uh, caller, you're going to have to wait for a minute, please. Uh, T.F. Richard says, if my memory serves right, the last tanker came from China. Uh, Carlene Vespre says, this panel is a disgrace. Jackie O says, next fire, we will know which one works. It seems like only when there's a fire, they know what's working and what's not working. <laughs> Alistair Warwood says, <laughs> citizens are begging year after year for a truck in Satyrs and in St. David's to no avail. Sandra Davis says, please help. The them journalists need to ask better questions. My God, poor, poor. Good question. Good uh, point, Sandra. Uh, Jackie O says, free comedy with no laughter. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Anthony DeRigg says, if a real big fire takes place, crapo smoke we pipe. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. John Franco says, Grenada is surrounded by water and not one pumper that can draft from the sea. Now that's a joke. I worked 16 years as a mechanic for a city that maintained all fire trucks. T.F. Richard says it's because of news conferences like this that Gigi's computer is now giving trouble because his MechWeChat panelists would have had a field day <laughs> <laughs> on foolishness. Ah, uh, they may yet. Martin Jessamy says, upgrade, installation of fireman safety switches on buildings. Uh, Shirley Simpson says, yes, it's me, Shirley Simpson, the singer. Good morning, my dear George. Happy, blessed new year. Keep up the good job you're doing. John Calise to say good morning. Martin Jessamine says the schoolboys and girls work with them. Byrons, peddlers, runners. That's just the first one. Needs to crack down. On these kinds of playhouses. Martin, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Wheel and turn again. Wheel and come again. Shirley Simpson says, uh, we'll skip that. John Calais says, Grenada always has a fire truck problem when responding to fire. It's time that they seek help with training. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, Roger Mitchell says, I always say that urban planning is a bad word for the government of Grenada. Alrighty, folks, I'll tell you what, we'll take a little break right now, and then we'll come back with that segment from the CBI Citizenship by Investment post-cabinet briefing that was held uh, just, uh, I think it was on Tuesday of this past week. 
Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Conveniently located in the Grand Anne Shopping Center, for over 40 years, Food Fair has provided quality service at affordable prices. Now, grocery shopping is made easier and more convenient from the Food Fair web store. Hey, babe. Hmm? Listen, uh, I need you to go down to Food Fair to get some groceries. All right, no problem. Right away. Thanks, babe. What are you doing? You're supposed to be going to Food Fair to get a grocery, man. I am. But didn't you know you can order your groceries online from the Food Fair web store? Are you serious? Of course. All you have to do is just to log on to www.foodfair.gd with credit card in hand. And with an order of $100 or more, Food Fair Granans will deliver up to three miles away. And you don't even have to worry about your information, you know. The safety measures are excellent. So hold on. You just order online and Food Fair will deliver to you? Yep. Oh baby, better hurry up and order, man. <laughs> I already did. They should be here any minute now. Enjoy easy online shopping anytime from your home or office from the Food Fair web store. Food Fair, where you can fill your baskets without emptying your pockets. Hey, Lynn. Hey, neighbor. Here's the bill I asked you to pay for me. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LEDs. They burn less energy, right? Much less. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. And Grenlec is always advising us not to open the fridge too often. That's right. And my family washes and irons in bulk. With fuel prices changing all the time, how do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. So while Grenada can't control fuel prices, I can conserve energy and save money. Grenlec. Energizing our Grenada. Okie dokie, folks. Let's see what time it is here. Da -da 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 -da. About 15 seconds before 11 o'clock. Running a little bit behind this morning, but uh, that's good because I uh, just got off the phone with uh, Peter Andel, and he's going to be a few minutes late getting here as well, which gives us time. Eh, eh, eh? gives us time to uh, bring you our next media conference. Let me see here now. Yes, our next media conference. This was a post-cabinet briefing held on Tuesday of this past week, during which uh, persons involved with the Citizenship by Investment Program face the media, supposedly to, uh, you know, educate the Grenadian people about the program, and also to uh, clear up 
any misconceptions that they may have about the CBI program. Those are not my words. You'll hear that at the end of this piece. Um, attending that conference were, at the head table, Trade Minister Oliver Joseph, the chairman of the Citizenship by Investment Program, Senator Chris D'Alley, and the chief executive officer of the program, one of my uh, schoolmates, Presentation College, a gentleman by the name of Percival Clown. Okay. Pilgrims, I ran this piece one day during the week, this past week. There was a lot of reaction, a lot of reaction. When you see what you're about to see, you're not going to be too surprised. Check it out. What is the status of the Livera project with regard to what we would have seen published in the papers then? Is there also some type of investigation for clarity and so on? Well, I don't think Livera falls under the same kind of ambit as um, the shrimp farm. They would have had a previous investor that would probably not have met certain conditions. And um, we have a new investor now that's looking at Livera. And my information is that the new investor and the previous investor are in negotiations to tie up whatever issues that may have arisen. So that is the status with Livera, but Livera is proceeding as we are far as we are concerned under the new investor um, as it should be. I know that you are recently appointed, <laughs> but at the time the Prime Minister did say that the government had to take some new measures with regard to funding, with regard to escrow accounts. Um, since that time, what is the new uh, measures um, that has to be taken with regard to protections of um, persons who are investing in accounts? Yeah, thank you for this question because I should have mentioned that since after the incident that you mentioned with the shrimp farm, we have gone to Parliament and passed legislation demanding that investors open an escrow account locally so that the funds for the project will be deposited in an escrow account in Grenada. That is to safeguard what happened previously because this is a new program for us and you will have new issues arising all the time. And as issues arise, we examine it, and if we need to amend the law or change policy or procedure, we do that. So, so yes, the law has been amended to ensure that local escrow accounts have been established in which the funds will be deposited for projects. That's the funds from the people who are investing in the project or funds for the project? Funds from the person who are investing in, in the project, to develop the project. Um, with regard now to our, um, the international um, uh, agents, I think they're called marketing agents, mm -hmm. right? Are you in a position to tell us the number of international as well as local agents? There are 46 marketing agents and 22 local agents. International marketing agents? Yes. 46. 46. Local agents, 22. Sorry. My other question has to do with one person had asked me in a, a conversation, and I'm going to ask you here, whether or not a person who would have obtained a uh, passport, what happens when it has to be renewed? Is it renewed how well I, a local will walk in and say, I'm here to renew my passport and provide the, requ the requisites? Or do they have to do it again through the agents and the due diligence process must be involved? How are persons who obtain in citizenship um, and have a passport renew their passport? What's the process? It's through the regular renewal process. And they don't have to come back to CBI for another approval. However, our due diligence activities are so, are so heavy that should there be any obstruction while you have had a Grenada passport, the due diligence companies do follow up 
on those who were issued passports and should they find anything derogatory or negative, we have the option to revoke the passport. The program started since 2013. Have we revoked any persons who have received passports? Have we received, revoked any citizenship and um, passports? Not to my knowledge at this point. Um, on, the, on the issue of the shrimp farm, we know that monies were received, passports were, were issued, citizenship was, was granted and passports issued so that the government would have uh, collected revenue, I think it was 50,000 US dollars per. Um, can you tell me what, which fund that money went into and how, what, how did Grenada use that money? Well, as indicated earlier, Kalistra, we would reserve comment on the shrimp farm issue until the investigations are completed. Okay. <clears throat> Rina Pierre, um, GBN, Minister uh, Joseph, my questions are for you. Um, could you comment? I know that the U.S. Sec um, Secretary for the State is visiting Jamaica to visit with, to meet with CARICOM leaders um, next week. Could you tell us who would be representing us or if we'll be represented at all? This matter did not come up yesterday at yesterday's cabinet meeting, so I do not have an answer for you. Okay. Um, another question. It's relating to your constituency. We have the juvenile center. Um, that will be in tonight. But anyway, the juvenile center. We want to know if, well, I would like to know if um, the center is really fulfilling their intentional purpose at this point in time. I really would like to know that. And um, as it relates to the young men or young people involved, um, proper supervision. We had six, one still at large. Do we have the proper supervision for them? As far as I'm aware, the this center is playing a critical role in helping shape and transform lives of young people. There are a lot of benefits. They did extremely well last year in the CXC exams and in the skills reading. So from my knowledge of it, it's meeting its objective. Um, with respect to the person that you said is not yet it's still missing, I cannot comment. I have no further information on that. But I know that they have they are properly staffed. And the Ministry of Social Services is a ministry that under which they operate. Um, so I could only speak from the best of my knowledge, sitting in cabinet and listening to the minister, that we are satisfied with how it is operating. Um, in the discussion yesterday, was there anything as to uh, measures made to let the, with the six being gone, um, well, not being gone, but being able to leave the facility, any extra measures being put in place to ensure that? Yes, the minister called an emergency meeting of the board of directors and staff to discuss measures that will be put in place to ensure that that does not happen again in the future. My, my final question, it's regarding the Langai corner. Um, I know that there's some work being done at it. I think it's in between Windsor Paris and Peg Motor. There's been work being done there, but motorists and persons are concerned that it's still a safety hazard um, and thinking that the road should be closed for a while or until the, the situation has been fixed. Yeah, I've heard that concern is in my constituency. Work started to build a wall and then the road collapsed and they started digging into it. When I spoke to the Ministry of Works engineer, they said they are meeting with the police and they will make a decision. First of all, they were looking at having it only one way instead of blocking it off for two weeks. But this decision is made between the engineers in the Ministry of Works and the police department. And they will decide whether it, to block it off completely or whether or not it is one way. My, the latest report that was given to me is that it is a one-way traffic at the moment. Um, Minister, if I could just go back to the gentleman at the CBI. Um, you mentioned of an investigation. Can you disclose to us who is conducting that investigation? Um, <clears throat> I know um, it's handled by our Attorney General's office. Our 
oh, sorry, sometime last year, I think, in 2020, right? I think in 2018, under the CBI website was noticed of, um, I think it was the people who are the, the shrimp farm, no application is accepted from that company, to that company. It is posted on the website, I think it was from October 2018, that no, um, the, the committee is no longer accepting application to that project. Are there any projects that Grenada has ceased to accept application from? And um, from the time it has started, are you in a position to tell us how much the CBI is contributing to our GDP? I can see that there are no further applications on the shrimp farm issue. Yeah, I All right. That is close. Is there other projects where no. similar measures were taken? Not, not on the current projects that we have, apart from the shrimp farm issue. Uh, GDP contribution, CEO, you have an idea? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I would estimate it to be about 10%. Is it that 10% annually from 2013 or 10% for 2019? For 2019. Do you have data for the other years? No, or? no, I don't, I don't have prior years data. Um, that contingency um, fund law that was passed, I um, think, in December, can you es explain it a little bit more to the general public, please, Minister? Yeah, sure. Now, under the Act, CBA Act requires us to put aside 40% of revenue earned from the CBI into a contingency fund that we can use in case of emergency. So if you have any disaster and you need to respond to it, you have 40% of the fund set aside. That is different from when we present the budget and we talk about a contingency under the budget. That's the, this contingency and the budget is for, to meet recurrent expenditure. So this contingency fund is directly related to the revenues collected on the CBI that must be set aside. So we have a set aside of 40% of the revenue collected that we can use and the act goes into all the data, how we could use it, when you could use it, what will trigger it. You know, I say disaster is one um, such area in which you can use this um, contingency fund and therefore the law sets clearly um, the, the, how you could access this contingency fund. I, I know that it should be managed, I think, or supervised by a committee. Can you tell us who are, who are the members of that committee? Right. As well as who are the other members of the current CBI committee, besides the chair which were introduced oh, The CBI com current CBI committee? No, well, you're talking about two different committees. Yes. I will deal with one with the contingency. Okay. The chair will decide, will tell you about who are the members of the current CBI committee, right? Now, there's a committee... What the Lord identifies the area from which the people must come from, so the act was passed in December to take effect in January. Um, very soon, cabinet will name the members. The ECCB will have representative. In fact, the ECCB, the funds will be held. The ECCB will have um, control in terms of investing the funds. And, and where is the best place to invest the fund? Uh, well, you know, on the international market to invest this fund. Because if you have 40% 40 40 in a contingency fund and it's just lying there, then you get no benefit from it. So it will be done to invest. Um, so it's very soon, the, the members, as I say, all what the, the act says is where they should come from. One from finance, one from accounts, you know, one from business, and it will be named um, very shortly um, by the cabinet. The other the members of the current committee will be dealt with by the chairman. Right. Uh, well, we have myself as chairman. Our deputy chair is Mr. Ronald Tiero from GIDC. We have Mr. Philbert Charles um, sitting. We have Dr. Wayne, Fra um, Wayne Sandiford, Ms. Ophelia Wells, and Ms. Edith McDonald, and Senator Katisha Williams. Gentlemen, may I just ask, uh, while Grenada is a prime country, what else can be done under the CBI program to ensure that the program maintains its credibility and possibly even become better? <laughs> Thank you. Um, one very important um, point to maintain its integrity and um, expand it 
um, in terms of longevity um, would be the due diligence factor. Um, that clears us from accepting or putting through in our communities undesirables. And I, I think that's one of the most important things. The other important thing is we, in terms of program, we are instituting now um, some mechanisms where we monitor the payments coming in. Um, we want it to be on a timely basis. So we have been developing um, processes to maintain that. As, as I'm on the line, I would just, um, I want to compliment the minister and, and the administration for having thought to put 40% in um, a set-aside account for um, incidentals, like disasters. I, I spent a long time in a disaster area. Um, and after a hurricane, for example, people, the residents go scampering here, there, and everywhere without direction, without any um, monies, help, except for the federal government because it's a U.S. territory. We don't have a federal government, a U.S. government to back us up. So that contingency fund is well placed. Let me, just, sorry, let me just add to the due diligence aspect that you mentioned, because I think it's important that we understand the multi-layered um, aspects of that. And um, because of how the program is set up, when a, when a potential applicant makes an application, um, there are a number of checks. So you have the international marketing agent that have to do some vetting and checking. You have the local agent, that's another layer, that has to do a number of checking. When monies are received through the banks and through the banking system, the source of the funding have to be checked again to make sure it's coming from a requisite source. And then we have the international agencies that do the checking like Exeter and, of course, FIU and so on that does further checks to make sure that these applicants so, uh, are what they say they are and the monies that they're, they're coming with comes from a, a, a source that can be trusted. So we have this multi-layered level of checking and security screening to ensure that we reduce the, the risk to almost zero and to ensure that the applicants that come are, are bona fide people. So that is, the, I wanted to spend a little time on that because I think it's important for the public and the general to know, understand that we do, we do maximum screening at both regional, international, and at international levels to ensure that the applicants are, are properly vetted. And that, that, to answer the question posed, that helps in ensuring that the program continues to have sustainability. Because if you have a program that um, attracts um, rogue people, then in no time your program can fall down based on pressures from the international community as well as the locals. So our, our, our system of checking depends heavily on an applicant actually not really being in any of the formal systems um, so that even if they are involved in anything questionable, unless they have been tracked officially by an agency or something, we, we really won't, we, we have no other way of, of um, there are no other methods besides what is already on the books. Well, I mean... If, you, if you're a citizen from another country that has a certain amount of disposable income and you want to apply to a program under citizenship, whether it's this country or any other country, first of all, the most import, one of the most critical checks is the money, follow the money. If you follow the money, you tend to get to an understanding of where or how the monies came about. Most, most of this will come from bona fide businesses that they invest in and so on. So we, we will follow that. And of course, we will follow the other things that comes with the application, your education level and so on, your citizenships and so on, so that we get a profile of the person. So when, they, when the international security companies do their checks, we check for bankruptcy, we check for um, companies that you are involved in, what, what business they're involved in, and, and that type of thing to ensure or to give us some level of satisfaction 
that when the monies come, and then the banks do their own checks to their own international agencies as well to ensure that these monies are coming from bona fide sources. If you're outside of a system, um, I don't know how, how it will come because if let's assume you're a drug lord and money laundering, you must put the money into the system somehow. And once the money comes in, then you, we follow the money. So it, it is difficult to be outside of the system and come into to say buy citizenship because you must declare the source of your funds, as an example. So, well, you know, terrorists and drug dealers, and so you usually find somebody clean to um, do, do, do their work for them and create their, their, their money trail. That is the whole point of it. Because um, I have a question for the minister. To, to add to the chairman's comments by um, putting out there that these due diligence companies, um, even if you're out of the formal system, they engage people on the ground in the communities from where these applicants come to do a report on them. So even if you're out of the system, there is someone going to find you. They're going to, because we we furnish data to the due diligence company that they send out the people on the ground to gather information. Minister, my hopefully final question. It has to do with uh, CCC. I understand that um, the CCC consolidated contractors that they. Um, that government is owing them quite a large sum and there are some difficulties there and uh, that government might be planning to engage a Chinese company to do some of our major road works that CCC would have traditionally done. Can you comment on that, please? Um, no, um, I cannot comment because I don't have the information. Minister, just a little bit more on that um, CBI program. Um, one of the benefits is Guinea's Grenada citizenship. Has Grenada, as the minister, sit in parliament, sit in cabinet, has Grenada appointed any of the CBI citizens to, to a diplomatic post? And if so, stay there. No, no, that diplomatic post is something completely different from the CBI program that was that truck. My understanding is to become a, a diplomatic representative of Grenada, you have to be a citizen and you can gain your citizenship through CBI as well through naturalization as well as birth. So has anyone who have gained citizenship through CBI has been appointed by this government to serve in any diplomatic position? No, I said the diplomatic track is different. And if you're an ambassador at large, you don't have to be a citizen. An ambassador at large does not get the diplomatic immunity, you know. People think because you're the ambassador, you get diplomatic immunity. When you're accredited to a state, so if we appoint you as ambassador to Cuba or the United States or whichever state you're appointed. And the receiving state will do all the due diligence check and accept you, then you get the diplomatic immunity. If we appoint someone that is a say like if we have an ambassador to the United States that have citizenship of the United States, they will say this person cannot get the diplomatic immunity because they're one of our citizens, right? So the, the protocol established, the Vienna Convention of 1961, deals clearly with the established immunity and the protocols and how people will be treated. There is a whole international protocol, the Vienna Convention governs that. So the same diplomatic immunity that the US ambassador will have here, that's a point of Grenada, our ambassadors the United States will have diplomatic immunity and privileges. If you, as I said, appointed an ambassador at large, so that means you are not appointed to any country. It's just uh, an envoy. You would not receive diplomatic immunity. There are some courtesies that will ex be extended to you and airport arrivals and so on. You will see a line saying diplomats and you enter it, but you are not immune from anything. And I think that sometimes it's confused with all diplom dip holders of diplomatic passports getting immunity. It is not like that. I, I do understand what you're saying, but sometimes we have people who um, are led to believe differently, and that's why I ask if we have CBI citizens who were ever appointed to hold diplomatic posts. That's my reason. For uh, that. No, no. The answer is no. Yeah. Um, <coughs> just a <coughs> question. Um, Based on a lot of um, things being said and, and reports made by Al Jazeera and stuff like that, my question is, is 
um, here, our CBI program, is there any case where, or is there anything stating where um, ministers or persons within government um, bringing in investors to be a part or introducing investors to be a part of the CBI program? Do they have that kind of privilege? Well, uh, anybody could bring an investor to the country. Um, the idea is if you want to do your investment under the CBI umbrella, then you have to follow the dictates of the law that um, allows you the privileges to be part of the CBI program. But um, investors don't have to come under CBI, and anybody could introduce an investor. I could introduce an investor to the government in a particular area where they may think that there is need for development and so on. So it doesn't, um, doesn't restrict in that sense. But once you want to come under CBI, then you have to follow the rules and, and um, the law that the CBI will have for that. Um, my final question to you, Senator Diali. Um, there are people who feel that right at, in your present position you have an, a conflict of interest. You represent the business community in the Senate, and now you're representing a government entity. What's your comment to this? Well, interestingly, I don't see the conflict, but um, uh, um, as chairman of CBI, I only have one vote on the committee as chairman. Um, I'm governed by a board, and if there is conflict, then I excuse myself, state the conflict and excuse myself. So we recently had an application that was put forward by CBI as an example. Um, and that person was a member of my family, and I excused myself from the room, and then the rest of the committee handled the application. So if things like that come up, I mean, there's a protocol established for conflict of interest and whether it comes, and if once it comes up, you, you do what has to be done. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> thanks, Liz. Any update on our oil and gas situation? I don't think we've, we've heard anything for a while. The last I heard was that a Chinese uh, company had bought over interests from the Russians, who seems to have run out of the requisite funds for what needed to be done. Any any updates? And uh, can we now say, I know government had uh, refused to tell the people of the nation what is this new, the name of the new entity that now has exploration rights. Can we now know? So an update, sir. The government has made all the information available, and what the latest position you've heard from the government is still the latest position. I know, no, have no other information to the contrary uh, concerning an, any new company or whether drilling. I think the appropriate minister, minister responsible for energy, will make a statement in due course to keep the nation involved. Colleagues, are we through? All right, thank you so very much. Is there any final word any member on the head table would like to make before we wrap this up? Yeah, I, I want to say that this citizenship by investment, perhaps we need to do more public publicity with respect to how the country is benefiting. Because coming into St. Davis will be a, a, a new hotel that will be constructed as a result of the citizenship by investment program. This hotel is expected to create hundreds of jobs for people of Grenada. And of course, for St. David's, it's huge because we need to attract investment of that need here into the rural areas of Grenada. And we have other areas in the island, St. Mark's, for example, where I know our next CBI project is going to be located. And there are tremendous benefit. So th this fear of um, CBI, I think, is because of a lack of knowledge and maybe the citizen not involved enough. So I'm aware that the CBI committee has um, this year decided to keep the, f the public relations up in terms of informing the public of the benefit of the program because it does bring a lot of benefit to the people of Grenada. I share the same sentiments as the minister. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you very much uh, to the minister and, of course, the officials at the head table and to all our colleagues and, of course, all of you viewing online or on uh, GIS TV, GBN, as well as MTV. So just to remind you, the Honorable Oliver Joseph, Minister for Trade, Industry, Cooperatives and Caricom Affairs. To my immediate left, to his left, Mr. Christopher Diali. He's the chairman of the CBI. And to Mr. Diali's left, Mr. Percival Clowden, the CEO of CBI. And, of course, we've been speaking this morning specifically specifically about the Citizenship by Investment Program. And it is important to note, as the Minister said, more needs to be done just so that the public understands the benefits of the CBI and that there are no misconceptions. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Alrighty, folks, so I'm going to begin by asking you the question, were the misconceptions about the CBI program cleared up for you? Don't have to answer right now. Now. My next guest has arrived, Peter Randall. And <laughs> you thought the first two segments were interesting? Wait until this man opens up. However, because this last press conference that I ran for you aroused so much emotion, I feel it absolutely necessary that I share some of the comments with you this morning. Let me start here with, uh, oh boy, where is it? T.F. Richard says, George is in a jolly mood, folks. He's running two Grenadian sitcoms for us to vote the best. My pick is Oliver in Charge, <laughs> starring Oliver Joseph. What a laugh. That's a start. Um, Eric Stone says, the more some people misappropriate funds, the more they get work. What was the end result of the Garden Group? Can you tell me if there was ever an investigation, George? Do me a favor, Eric. Don't ever mention the word investigation. That, that's a cuss word as far as I'm concerned. There are so many investigations in this country that are supposed to have taken place, and you never, ever hear the outcome of them. So, do go day. All right? Um, T.F. Richard says, quote, the person that is not yet still missing, unquote. That's a quote from Oliver Joseph. And... Uh, TF says, Oliver gets a Grammy or an Oscar for that one. Um, Ryan Jabon says, no transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness in the enigmatic St. Mark's shrimp farm debacle. So hope you're not holding your breath. John Khalees says, they cannot answer about the shrimp farm. Is it because they cannot account for the money? How long would they take to finish the investigation? So says John. Uh, T.F. Richard says, the Attorney General's office is now investigating. How laughable. Jackie O says, he gets both for different categories. One, lack of knowledge for not knowing anything. Two, Creativity for thinking of a quick excuse to dismiss the question. Margaret Francis says, these reporters are letting this panel get away with murder. They have been so, there have been so many opportunities for follow-up and more probing questions to pin them down. It's just pissing me off. Margaret, Sunday morning girl, watch your tongue. Cassandra Mitchell says, to date, the citizenry hasn't been told who was leading the investigation into the shrimp farm saga. Now, I'm hearing that it has been, or it's been handled by the Attorney General's office. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the RGPF constitutionally responsible for criminal investigations? T.F. Richard says, uh, okay, forget about T.F. John Kelly says, some people can answer about the shrimp farm, but you shout down Calistra when she asked about the farm and the money. So where 
is the fund invested? T.F. Richard says, the result of the Garden Group is that the small hoteliers involved, some died and others got sick and lost their investments. <laughs> ah, I hope Mr. Ando is listening to this one. Uh, Dennis Charles says, keep up the good work, Sir George. I have great confidence in you. Moi, you are the people commenting out there, not me. You're the people. T.F. says, listen to what that guy said, and it shows the mantle of this government. They're monitoring to make sure that the money is paid on time. <laughs> Ryan says, CBI monies, 40% in a contingency fund. Then where is the other 60%? T.F. Richard says, they have multi-layers of security screening, but in today's world, VIPs are not screened. What's a VIP, T.F.? Roger Mitchell says, did he really say the FIU? Like, really? T.F. says, I surely, I'll surely have a good appetite for lunch today after looking at these two sitcoms. I should have asked Mags to make some of her food available today. <laughs> uh, John Kelly says, well, it seems that the checking system has failed because some of the people involved have been under investigation. So how is that working for them? What profile they used? Because the opposite does not show that they're all clean. John, 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 think before you type, think. Uh, T.F. Richard says, Roger Mitchell, when these guys look back at these conferences, they have to laugh at themselves. But then again, they look back at it when they're having drinks. <laughs> Andrea St. B says, did they get a profile of Charles Liu and profiles of all the other Convestors, not investors, convestors who have come, gone, and left the island in debt. McMahon Alexander says in Grenada, you all don't turn you all back on any money. Roger Mitchell says, I'm parking this one right. The CBI program in Grenada has seen its last days. Tessa Barry is asking, who is doing due diligence on the due diligence companies? <laughs> uh, Eric Stone says, T.F. Richards, my point is different. Andrea St. B. Okay, forget about Andrea there. Cassandra says, as it relates to the mention of contingency funds, Section 79 of the Constitution states, Parliament may make provision for the establishment of a contingencies fund and for authorizing the minister for the time responsible for the finance. If satisfied that there has arisen an urgent and unforeseen need for expenditure for which no other provision exists to make advances from that fund to meet that need. Is there or was there an urgent, unforeseen need for expenditure that we aren't aware of? Okay. Uh, T.F. Richard says, Straker, I guess referring to Ms. Straker, needs to stop making the minister expose his level of incompetence. <laughs> oh. Uh, ta -da -da. Okay, folks, I really, really want to get to my next guests. I'm just going to pause here on the comments. Let me take a quick break, and then the next person you'll be seeing is this gentleman. Take a look. There he is, Mr. Peter Endel. He will be with us right after Inspection and licensing have begun, and at Hubbards, we want you to be ready. From January to February 15th, we're offering vehicle owners with single registration letters 1 to 2,500 and plural registration letters 1 to 250. 
10% off our new torque tires and Power Max batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at our motor department in Mungay or our tire bay in Grand Dance located near Hubbard's Building Supplies. I'm always on the move, training, traveling, competing. So it's good to know I have Quad Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing e-banking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Corporate Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our spice island. Friendlich, energizing our Grenada. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates. 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Alrighty, folks, we have been waiting on this gentleman to show up, Peter Randall. You know, um, I think this is probably the first time we're really going to have a nice long chat. Um, I have been one of the big fans of uh, a property he ran on Melville Street. You know that restaurant right next to uh, the bus terminus? Yeah, man. Georgie Porgy has had many a meal in there, but that's now been sold to Huggins, as I understand, and I don't know what they're going to be doing with it. But nevertheless, he's here this morning, and the reason why I asked him to come in is because once we heard, and those an associate closed, the rumor mill began. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot has been said. And I wanted to I wanted to get it from the horse's mouth. I wanted this gentleman to give me a little bit, as I described it on the site, a chronology of what happened, including a little bit about himself, because I really don't know much about a man except I own some supermarket and you know. So take a look. Peter Randall, good morning, sir. And how are you? Good morning. Good morning, George. Welcome. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I get you out of bed on a Sunday morning. No, I've been up. Long time ago. You've been up early? Yep. Yeah, early to rise. Early, early to, to bed, rise. early to early rise. To rise. Yeah. To rise. Peter, you heard my little introduction here. And I want you to try and explain things to people so that they could say, well, I heard it from Peter Rando. Yeah. Okay. Start by telling me a little bit about Peter Rando. Who are you? Okay. Let me start. Um, Black boy from St. Patrick's, born in Prospect, St. Patrick's. Um, went to school at the Samaritan Primary School. And then to McDonald College. I got a scholarship in those days. McDonald College, five years, no, actually four years. I went into Form 2, McDonald College, and graduated in 1970. It was. I spent a short stint at GBSS. I wanted to do A levels. Didn't stay there very long. Times was hard. My parents was very poor. I had to find a job. So I left school. I got my first job at um, Nawasa or at 
those days, Central Water Commission. Class two clock, I think it was. Yeah. It's been about six years at that um, establishment. And then moved on to Holiday Inn, which is now Radisson. Mm -hmm. Spent another, I think, approximately five, five and a half years at that location. That's establishment. That was the sum total of my employment. But while I was there, I started a small business in Tempe, close to the Coke factory. Um, and when I left Holiday Inn, I expanded. I opened another um, location on Lucas Street. And then I got involved in Ideal Bakery and two other, three other um, gentlemen, gentlemen put together and bought that establishment from Mr. Noel. It was. And uh, in a way, Ideal Bakery is what um, put me on my feet. But I sold my shares in that company, I think it was 19, maybe 1990, thereabout and got into supermarket in all this. My first um, outlet was in Belmont. Um, I went to that place from, I think it was, hmm. remember the gentleman in now, Belmont, Belmont Main Road at, at the time. I quickly um, moved on to United Grocers in Tears Street. Bought that from um, Benjamin Mitchell. And from there, um, continued outletting um, River Road, another one in Springs, then Parade, Grenville at the box shop. And I think the last one I opened was Guav. And all this was done before I went. And You're talking about six outlets here? Yeah, I was six outlets. Okay. And then came Ivan. And Ivan, we got looted out almost completely. Four outlets got looted out completely. Grenville, Guav, Springs, River Road. Looted out completely. Uh, parade, the roof got damaged, and um, carnage was pretty much intact. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where I started um, after Ivan. There was a short time I thought, you know, something, this doesn't make sense. But then I quickly. Doesn't make sense, and you have seven to, businesses going? Well, remember, like I said, four of them was looted. Okay, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Stocks, equipment, everything. Yeah. Plus, we had some damages to the building in parade. And although we was insured, insurance com we was insured for looting. So, of course, the insurance company didn't pay us for the stock. That was looted out. Or equipment. Okay. Yeah, so, so for a while after Ivan, it felt like this doesn't make sense. You know. But I quickly got myself together and started rebuilding. I um, renovated Grenville. Um, renovated parade. We didn't, we never um, returned to Guav. We never returned to Springs. We never returned to River Road. But before Ivan, I had contracted with um, Zublin as the people who was developing Melville Street. No more. Yes. Mm -hmm. To buy portion of land, and that was to establish a supermarket next to the bus terminal in town. And in a way, that, that was, my focus was on that. Get so that. Where, where the Melville Street uh, supermarket is, or was, um, you bought that from Zublin? Yes. It's, 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 it, well, it doesn't bought really, it's more the lease. Okay. 66 year lease. Go ahead. So in 2008, we did that building on Melville Street. And um, 
for a short while, it was doing fine. And then it was 10, 11, the downturn started in Grenada, where the economy really went. And, and for quite a few years, we really struggled. Um, and despite appeal to my bankers to reschedule the loans, they, they didn't work with me. So finally, in um, 2018, we decided we need to sell Melville Street. The debt servicing for that loan was just too much for the company. Mm. So that's how Melville Street went? Yes. And I think um, the, the sale of Melville Street is what triggered this whole episode of government. Let's get down to brass tacks. <laughs> Yep. Once we once once we confirm with the with, um, the IRD that the sales are ready to go through, and ask to provide um, the exact figure that we need to pay for the transfer tax. That set, I mean, just a train of actions, you know, that um, resulted in ambulances just in fact having to. Closed the doors a few weeks ago. Um, where do I start? Before, well, when uh, when you decided to sell Melville Street, right? Were you already in any hot water with the government? Well, we owe them taxes. Um, VAT, VAT, yeah, VAT, and, and some. Um, VAT, and there was some stamp tax. Uh, VAT, stamp tax, I think it was three different taxes. VAT, stamp tax, three, three different taxes anyway. VAT, stamp tax, and um, possible be income tax. Okay. For the company. All right, so you were owing the government. So, all right, and you... I imagine that you were hoping that some of the money generated from that sale would go towards taking care of those taxes, or is that just an Actually, assumption? no. Actually, no. The, the, the monies from that sale was going to go directly to our bankers. Because you owe the banks as well? Yes, you owe the banks. Um, banks as well. And um, when, when, when the government, or the IRD, um, received a letter from them, from basically a copy of a letter they sent to both, they sent a letter to um, the Controller of Customs, yeah, instructing them not to clear any goods for Handel and Associates. They sent a letter to um, the Chief, Chief Registry, I think it is, instructing them not to register any deed from Andal and Associates to any company. Um, and that's when we asked to have a meeting with them to find out well, why, you know, what's the reason for, the, for those actions. And they said to us, well, after we met with the Controller of the Inner Revenue Department and um, gentleman, Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, I think Mr. Alexander is his name. Anyway. And they inform us that, well, you owe the government taxes, you know, millions of dollars, and um, you haven't paid, and they want the money. And I explained to them, listen, we just want to settle the banks first. And once that is done, we will get a loan, a new loan now, to pay off the debt we owe the government. And um, they, they seem very... Um, receptive at that meeting, um, and the, the, the deputy um, says, and that is instructed Mr. Control of Customs, Mr. Stephen, to issue a letter stating exactly what tax we owe in, and also to state that if that money is paid within a specific time, government will be willing to waive penalty and interest.
about a week later, we got a letter, we got a letter from the control of the United States Department stating how much tax we owe in, but omitting the second part about the waiving of penalties and interest. At the same time, also, he sent a letter to the bank, that first Caribbean international, instructing them to garnish four point something million dollars from our account to pay the government for taxes. We met with him about a week later. That time, my, my solicitor was there with me. And uh, just so to get a sense of you know why he, you know is he going this route when we we well I wouldn't say agreed but we have informed him that um, we was going to get a loan after we pay off the banks to pay off government. Long and short, he said basically, no, government wanted. Um, money is now from the sale of the property. And in fact, he um, indicated that a million dollars now would be what he's looking for. And we explained to him that, well, based on the monies we will receive from the sale after we pay off, you know, the banks and so on, the money remaining wouldn't be that much. And in any case, we have to pay off the workers who will be, will be dismissed from Melbourne Street because of the closure of that outlet. And so we offered to pay give government $250,000 from the sale of the property. And he, as is the control of cost of inner revenue department, said no. That government wouldn't set up for that. Anyway, um, in truth and in fact, we actually paid the government from the sale of the, of, of the property about $400,000, three something, $400,000. Sir, how much? About $400,000. $400,000. Right. Um, despite that, government refused to release our containers just on the port. And um, in truth and in fact, um, subsequent to that, they issued two, another two garnish letters. They sent them one to Core Bank and a further letter to FCID. Well, I probably should backtrack. Um, the first letter they sent to FCID, of course, the monies wasn't in, in the account. So that garnish letter didn't succeed in getting any money to the government because the monies that went to FCIB was just the amount that we were owing them. So there was no extras. And, and, it, and it appears that um, when the controller realized that the monies he, he was hoping to get from the sale didn't come true. It seemed to have triggered a, 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 a sort of angry response, you know. Um, and I think the letters that that he issued to um, to Core Bank was based on that anger. And it was at that point when we realized that um, we had issued checks to suppliers and the checks was returned. And it's at that point that I realized that it was almost impossible to operate. If you cannot pay your suppliers because your Congress is garnished, then you really can't operate. And that is when I took the decision to, to close. All right, look, I think we all know that it's like a, a mortal sin to not pay taxes. Okay. All right, then. That's accepted. Um, 
But sometimes you, you run into a bind, and I know you have some questions about the, the VAT, the way the VAT is set up and so on. But sometimes you run into a bind and you're not able to. Were you, because of the importance of your project to, your projects, your businesses to the national economy, at any point did you try and sit in with the government and say, okay, I've sinned, let's see how we could work something out. Set up a sort of schedule. Did you do that? You tried that? Yes, we tried that. Well, first of all, like I said, we, we, we at the very first meeting, we offered that we're going to six months period. We will get a loan within that period of time and eliminate the debt. And um, we was never told, okay, um, we, know, we prefer a payment plan. That was never said to us. It was like, the order said is basically, we want to sell more money up front. And we were saying, well, we don't have any money to give you up front. And not that much money that you want to get up front. We just don't have it. So, um, yes, we could pay you some money up front, which we did. But the balance of the money, we will raise a loan and pay you off within six months. And um, for some strange reason, that, like I said, although in the first meeting, they appeared to be receptive to the idea, subsequently, it seemed to be you know, not enough. Any suspicion as to why? Well, it's hard to, to know why, because you have in meetings, and first of all, it appears that the controller can't take a decision, or if he took a decision, he cannot um, exchange. So we might we, we have a, a, a discussion, and it appears that okay, there is some sort of agreement. But a week later, it's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. Okay, but obviously, Peter, you guys got to a point where something happened because I understand that your doors are open again. All right. So, <laughs> what okay. happened? Okay, okay. Now, uh, let me explain from my point of view how I saw it. We, d we deal with a number of banks in the United and our main bankers were FCIB, Core Bank, to a lesser extent, um, Republic Bank. And a very small business with um, uh, CIBC. So when our two main banks was targeted for garnishing, FCIB and Core Bank. And then we, we, very strangely, in the notice that came to us regarding Core Bank, there was a sec, there was, in fact, we get two copies of the same letter in an envelope from um, in the department. And it strikes me that there had to be a mistake. Why would they send me two copies of the same letter? And I'm kept thinking and saying, I think what happened there is that they sent another letter to another bank. And somehow, instead of giving me one for each bank, they gave me two for, for the same bank. And I surmise that most likely that means they target another account in another bank. Turns out that they send a second letter to FCIB. And I don't know why. Um, so our calculation was that, OK, if they garnish their account in, in Core Bank, they probably garnish their account in, 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 the, in the other bank also. So we really can't operate. Um, 
after being closed for almost two weeks, I recognized that listen, I need to do something to get ourselves going again because we got suppliers who are on our back, they're not getting paid, employees home, and as the day, as, as the time passes by, you got stuff in, in your freezers, in your chillers going bad. What do you do? Um, it was clear to me that 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 the the original plan of getting the monies from another bank to pay off the government because of the garnishing letter, that would have put a damper on on that mm. process. And we thought that um, the bank might be hesitant now in giving us that loan. So I thought, okay, probably what I should do is use another company to get the money to pay government. And so um, I would to government and say, listen, we will get another company to buy out the business and see if they could raise the money to pay you out, because we think that at this point in time, and also this might be not in the best position to raise that money now, because of the Kanishi letter. Because that letter really make the bankers kind of, you know, look twice. It's, it's really something that put a, a, a nervousness with bankers are concerned. So, so I, I want to find out how you got back. Right. So, <laughs> so I, I wrote the government and said, listen, this is what we're going to do. Yes? And, and I believed that because of the uproar over the closure of the company, they wouldn't continue garnishing our money. So I took the chance to reopen the business and, and, put, the money, and put the money in, in our account that they haven't yet garnished. And use that, uh, that account to run the business. It's as simple as that. Hoping, f believing that the response from them would be positive and there wouldn't be any negative action taken by government. And there hasn't been? No, there hasn't been, there hasn't been since. There hasn't been since. But we've been in negotiation with government since. And... Um, we're not even making much progress. You're not making much progress? No, not making much progress. So you're saying that there is a possibility that doors may once more be closed? There is a possibility. Because also, the company is, is suffering financially. Because remember, we have almost three quarter million dollars sitting on the port. Those that have been paid for. But for what puzzles me, Peter, is that Andal and Associates from, I'm not a, an accountant, but the man on the street looks at your business and says, hey, there's a business that's doing pretty damn good. You always have a steady flow of traffic. How come you guys have money problems? Well, like I said, our, our problem is, is basically um, what we call... Um, over leverage, that meaning you, you, the debt the company has um, taken on over the years to, 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 re, to relaunch itself after Ivan. Okay. Once business is not at a certain level, or is there a tongue tongue in business, it means you're starting to struggle. Mm. And for, like I said, for a number of years, we struggled. She really struggled. Mm -hmm. From 2012, come back 2018, 2019, we really struggled. So the, the, the accumulative um, losses over the years finally took it to a point where... Okay, took its toll. Yeah, it's just too difficult to continue. You know, I want to make it clear that uh, you, you held a press conference uh, uh, a few weeks ago up at Parade, which I attended. And I listened to you, and I actually played your press conference on this program. 
um, which gave us one side of the story. I like to get the other side. So I set out to get the, because you had made so much mention of the controller of Inland Revenue right. at your press conference, I tried to reach this man because I wanted to hear this side of the story. It's only fair, no? All right. Okay. You know, I tried for about a week. I just gave up. I, uh, I have too much on my hands to spend a lifetime chasing after people who just don't seem to want to talk to you. Okay. Okay. Um, but I would love to hear from him. I would love to hear from him. But I just want uh, you out there to know that we did right. try for some balance. Okay? Um, Jackie O says, the transparency is very convincing. And Ryan Jabon says, looks are deceiving. Tessa Barry says, Mr. Andel, what strategies as a businessman did you use during the struggling periods? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, my, my background, my background in business is very limited. Very limited. It might seem like I did all this. But it's very limited. Um, most of my what I would call training came from my stint at Holiday Inn, which they have a pretty good system that they use to operate. Holiday Inn is an international, international yeah, hotel. Yeah, sure. Yeah, pretty good system. But um, <coughs> during our uh, years when we were struggling, um, mostly what we try to do is, is, is to improve on our purchasing, the way we purchase stuff, so that we can maximize profit. Now, if you if you operate in a business in Grenada, and most of the stuff you sell is is bought from local importers, the margins you make on those things are not high. Very low margins, but if you can import stuff yourself, then you make a better margin. And we have tried to do that. Um, the problem you, you, you face is that you need money to do that. Mm. And um, our banks was not forthcoming in helping us. Mm. Go that route. So the best we could have done is, re is look to cut our, expen our expenses. There you go again. You got a problem there, right? There. Because some basic expenses, you 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 already have no control over. High power costs, um, telephone, water, and basic taxes that you pay in Grenada, that you can change. You know. Um, so there was not a hell of a lot we could have done in in in, in changing the, the, the trajectory of, of the business. Except we got some help from our bankers. And like I said, they were very, there wasn't food coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There wasn't food coming. Who are your associates? Your company is Andal and Associates. You're right. You're the CEO? Yes. yes. Okay. Who, who are these associates? The associates are employees. employees. Employees? Like they own shares in the company? They own shares in the company. Okay. Employees who make 10 years. Once you make 10 years, yeah. you're given shares or they have to purchase? Given shares. They're given shares. Okay. So those are the associates. Ah, okay, because that's a question that's been asked uh, since the last press conference. Um, okay. Peter, what's happening with the employees now are they satisfied that they're back at work and what percentage is everybody back at work? well they're satisfied to a certain extent but the cloud is still hanging over the company so there is this uncertainty as to will the company continue or they uh, shut its doors again so there's the uncertainty but um people are glad to be back at work that's for sure as you sit here now, can you look at me and say, George, boy, look, 
I really want this thing to get back on its feet. Um, but I have doubts. Is that how you feel right now? Or are you optimistic? Yeah, man, I'm going to fight this to the end. Sure, sometimes I'm feeling re I feel very tired fighting this battle. Sometimes I feel very tired fighting this battle. And in a way, I feel it's like a, a manufactured crisis that never really ought to have happened. For me, I thought it was a very simple matter of getting a, a, a loan, paying off government, and, and just moving forward, restructuring the company after we got rid of Melville Street. Because like I said, that was the albatross on, on the company's back financially. So I'm looking at this and saying, what, how did we, get, did we get here? Why? There was no need for this. See, like, this, it's, this it's, is it's what's puzzling. This was, is it's really puzzling. There's no need for this. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> understand why, why we even at this point. But here we are. T.F. Richards says, uh, I think he's somewhere on a truck in Idaho right now watching you. And he says, the issue of employees owning shares is the same trend Bill Gates used in Microsoft. Did you know that? Oh, no. I don't okay. know. Um, he also asked, Mr. Randall, as a local investor and entrepreneur, have you ever approached government for concessions? And if so, were they granted? Never approached government for concessions. You've never? Never, no. After Ivan, I thought maybe I should. But I found it very strange that our, our case was, I mean, wasn't hidden. Everybody knew under and Associates and what we went through in Ivan and our losses. And I found the government was quite willing to give concessions to hoteliers in the South after Ivan. And business people like us, nothing. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, maybe it's my pride. But I said, you know what? I can, I can do this on my own. I can, I can work this out. Well, that goes along with this next comment. Somebody named Roger Mitchell says, this business got to be f for Mr. Andel's control. Why didn't he hire professional help? That's a good question. Um, and professional help isn't, from my point of view, readily available. No? No. And probably I could have advertised for professional help. But, um, In, in, during the years, I, I hired um, a couple of managers, and it didn't improve the business. And what? It didn't improve the business. Okay. You know? Um, we had accountant on our staff, still have accountant on our staff. But? I, I think, I think, the answers, the answer, the answer to our problem was a bit, was not just getting professional help, I think. I think was getting um, financial support. And that is what we never had. You know, there are some people in this town, Peter, who just will never have access to financial support. <laughs> I guess you're one of them. Let me ask you this. Here, here's another comment. TF says, given the situation that is occurring, Mr. Randall, as a businessman, what advice do you have for persons getting into business in Grenada? People ask that question all the time. And I would say, be careful how much debt you take on. Because I think our problem was this. Okay. That we took on too much debt too quickly. Somebody named Hudson George says... I like the term used by Mr. Randall, manufactured crisis. Maybe some other interest groups don't want your business in town. I'm just guessing. So says Hudson George. Uh, well, that's, that's not new. Huh? That's not new. That comment is not new. 
You've heard that before. Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, TF has another question for you. And finally, as a businessman over the years, what do you think you could have done differently in terms of running the operation? Well, I guess that's managing your debt. Managing your debt, yes. Yeah? Yes, managing your debt. Um, we probably should have looked for um, equity financing, probably, instead of a bank loan. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you know, equity, you don't have to pay it back immediately. Mm -hmm. Bank loan, you need to pay it back. Um, probably got for investors, you know, get into the business. Beverly Sinclair says, if you never asked or applied for concessions, how would you have received it? And also, have the staff been paid for the period of closure? Yeah, they was paid. They've been paid. Uh, Lydia, <laughs> Lydia, Lydia James says, you had too much woman at Woman, W-O-M-A-N-A-G-E-R-S, woman managers. You had too many woman managers. You have women running your company? Yeah, well, at, at different levels, yes. Um, you, you work with what you have or what you can get. Um, and, and they're pretty good women managers. Okay. Um, Roger Mitchell says the answer is management. And Amanda gittens Batiste says financial support will not help if you don't have controls in place. It's got a point. Yeah? It's a point. It seems like we're getting to something here. Uh, TF is asking, so you're into equity financing now? If I'm into it? Yeah. Meaning... Are you willing to... Would you be willing to share? Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. All right. You know, I appreciate the honesty that I... Hold on a sec here. Beverly says, hiring help is only half of the solution. If the advice and recommendations are not taken and implemented, there will not be any impact on the business. Did you hire real qualified managers or just someone paid a bit more than the cashiers? Well, that's a bit of a... <laughs> That's debatable. Yeah, that's debatable. Okay, it, it seems like, you know, I get the feeling that in a kind of uh, way you're, you're admitting that management could have been a problem. Oh, yes, oh, yes. I, yeah. I, I admit that openly. I, I admit that openly. Okay. Because, you know, I, 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 the managers that I had, I wasn't happy with them. I didn't see get the result that I desired. Thought we should have, you know. And Taught you a lesson? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's some okay. of lessons to be learned from this episode. Okay. Well, and now you're going you're gonna to address that situation. The man lack of management. Well, it forced us to have to, to get these yes. things out with the government before we could address this. Because if it's really put a, like well, I said, a, have a to call, a, a, on, 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 the, on the company's operation. So unless, unless that is settled, the government, then we really can move forward. But do you think that the government has the foresight to recognize that, hey, if you're willing to do what you have to, to do regarding straightening out management and so on and so forth, this thing could be resolved and they get what you owe them? Well, we hope so. We hope that the government will. Have the foresight. Okay. But you are determined to make sure that you enhance your management structure. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm ready for this. So, you know, enhancing our management structure. Definitely. Amanda Gittens Batiste is saying here Mr. Randall, you need to look at business as a whole. Probably you might have to downsize, sell some more assets. And start over. Willing? willing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So far, he's willing to go along. TF says, as a Grenadian, I am proud of Mr. Randall and his business ventures. We, of course, have few locals of such on such a level. I do hope that you succeed in the future. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. You know, something I noticed about this whole saga, while there are people on the street out there who have been saying, hey, listen, man, you didn't pay your taxes, take what you get. There's so many people who recognize the value of your business to this nation's economy, and they were rooting for you. And I think that's... I know that. I think that's a good sign. It's a really good sign. Amanda says, start all over. Yeah, and sometimes that's what... Ryan says, the government of Grenada must realize that the bull in the China shop approach to taxes doesn't work. TF says, I also call on the government to give Ando the kind of breaks that they give to foreign investors. We, sorry, who leave without paying their bills and their money is not even saved or reinvested. I've been hearing a lot of that. How come they're going after this little Grenadian black boy? And millions and millions of dollars are being sucked out of this country on a daily basis. Millions. Gone. Peter, I hope that you have put the minds of Grenadians at ease that you recognize that there are problems, and that's the first thing. Before you can deal with a problem, you got to recognize that there is a problem. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you, openly, you seem to have done that here, openly. And you know what? Grenadians harsh, eh? But I think they recognize that. I think they recognize that, even before you came here this morning. Because that's the feeling I've been getting on the street. And so I wish you well. we got to go, but I wish you well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Peter, stand there for a minute. Stay there for a minute. Because uh, I, gotta, I can't wind up one of my programs without reading something from the Holy Scriptures. So uh, just hang on a sec, and uh, we'll do that, and then I'll let you go. All right? Hey, Lynn. Hey, neighbor. Here's the bill I asked you to pay for me. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LEDs. They burn less energy, right? Much less. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. And Grenlec is always advising us not to open the fridge too often. That's right. And my family washes and irons in bulk with fuel prices changing all the time. How do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. So while Grenada can't control fuel prices, I can conserve energy and save money. Grenlec, energizing our Grenada. Inspection and licensing have begun, and at Hotbots, we want you to be ready. From January to February 15th, we're offering vehicle owners with single registration letters, 1 to 2,500, and plural registration letters, 1 to 250, 10% off our new torque tires and power max batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at our motor department in Mungay or our tire bay in Grand Dance, located near Hubbard's Building Supplies. I'm always on the move. Training, traveling, competing. So it's good to know I have Quad Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing eBanking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Corporate Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. All right, all right, folks, just about time now to scoot. However, you last minute junkies have popped in here with some comments, and I wanna share them because I think they're important. First of all, 
Uh, Ryan Jabon says, Pete, you should be foreign. <laughs> T.F. Richard says, Grenadians don't like supporting local, and it's a fact, hence the reason some would rejoice. Renewed Purpose says, our local businessmen are treated like dirt, George. Maria St. Bernard says, I'm finding out that it is not easy to do business in Grenada as a born Grenadian, experiencing it myself. Renewed Purpose says, some complain about Andal not paying his staff well, yet the Syrians and other companies get away with murder. <laughs> He's smiling. Bradley Vesprey says, cash flight, George. TF says, maybe Mr. Andal needs to get... <laughs> oh, TF. Maybe Mr. Andal needs to get married to a foreigner and put her as the sole owner of the business. And he would fare better. You're not married? You and me both. Hey. Maybe that's the mistake we made, eh? Maybe. Bradley Vesprey says blessings and guidance. Okay. Uh... Roger Mitchell says, local people wanting to start a business get squeezed out some way or another. Uh -huh. Nicole Gittins Kishinama says, T.F. Richards, to all local businesses, because we are all struggling and need the breaks like the foreign investors. Okay, folks, we got to leave it there. Pilgrims, parting word from the Holy Scriptures before we hightail it out of here on this Sunday afternoon. Today's reading, very short, just two verses, come to you from the book of Psalms, Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Make a note. You too, Mr. Randall. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Pilgrims, woy, yo, yo, I've gone 33 minutes over time, thanks to this gentleman here, but I think it was worth it. I really wish him the very best. On that note, we're going to say goodbye. You go have a wonderful afternoon, go to the beach, go picnic, do whatever you want to do, but be sure to join us here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for the next edition of Good Day Grenada. God bless you, folks. See ya. See ya.